Section 25 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dean Rogers. Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, Part 2, Chapter 1. The following extract from the Brisbane Courier, dated 22nd February 1872, may be of interest to some readers as an introduction to what I have to say of my father's father, his explorations, discoveries, etc. Death of Mr. Andrew Petrie, Sr. The death of the oldest free resident in our community and colony is an event not to be allowed to happen without notice and the aged, revered, and useful citizen who has just left our world for a better was no ordinary man. The name of Andrew Petrie is indissolubly connected not only with the early history of Brisbane, but of the colony. Although for some years past incapacitated by a painful malady from active interference in the more prominent duties of life, he never relaxed his interest in all that was going on around him in the colony. For 34 years and more, he had watched its growth and advancement from the ignoble position of a mere outlying penal settlement of New South Wales to the dignified and important status of an independent province. From 1837 to the time of his death, he watched its progress with a solicitude which never flagged, rejoicing in its prosperity and sorrowing in its adversity. Though long deprived of bodily sight, his mental vision could, nearly to the very last, realize all that had been effected in the way of advancement in the city, which has grown up on the comparative waste on which he first landed. Mr. Petrie was a native of Fife Shear in Scotland, and was born in June 1798. In early youth, he removed to Edinburgh, where he was connected with an eminent building firm and served four years in an architect's establishment in that city. He embarked in business on his own account and was induced to emigrate to New South Wales in 1831 on representations of Dr. Lang. Arriving in Sydney in that year, in the ship Stirling Castle, he was employed in superintending the erection of the doctor's well-known buildings in Jamieson Street, and subsequently entered into business for himself. While thus engaged, his ability and probity brought him into notice, and at the solicitation of Mr. Commissary Laidley, he entered the service of the government as a clerk of works in the Ordnance Department. Shortly afterwards, the late Colonel Barney arrived in Sydney with a detachment of the Royal Engineers, and to this officer the control of the department with which Mr. Petrie was connected was transferred, and the deceased gentleman retained his position. In the same capacity, he was employed until his removal to Brisbane in 1837. The buildings which had then been erected in the city and were in course of construction had been designed and superintended by a junior military officer and were, naturally enough, not models either of architectural skill or substantial workmanship. Mr. Petrie was accordingly sent up as a practical superintendent or engineer of works, and he arrived with his family, Mr. John Petrie, the eldest, being then a mere boy, in August 1837, in the James Watt, the first steamer which ever entered what are now Queensland waters. His duties were to direct and supervise the labours of the better class of prisoners, mechanics and others, who were employed in an enclosure situated where St. John's School now stands. The windmill had been erected, but the machinery could not be made to work, although the sapient military officer had the bush cut down all around to allow the wind to reach the sails, and Mr. Petrie's first labour was to take down the machinery and set it up again in a proper manner. On his arrival, the only quarters available for himself and family were to be found in the female factory now the police office, which had been rendered vacant by the removal of the female prisoners to Eagle Farm. There Mr. Petrie resided until the house in which he lived and died was built, and as an instance of his foresight, he insisted on it being erected in a line with the courthouse, as there might someday be a street running that way. The locality was then simply in the bush. In 1838, while out on an excursion with Major Cotton, the Commandant, Mr. Petrie and his companions were lost for three days and found their way back to the settlement at last by taking bearings from the hill on the south side of the river, now known as Mount Petrie. In 1840, accompanied by his son John, two or three convicts, and two black boys, the deceased gentleman made an exploring trip into what is now known as the Bunya Bunya country, 
and the party were in extreme peril of their lives, but they succeeded in bringing back to Brisbane some specimens of the fruit. He was in fact the first to discover the Bunya Bunya tree, although its botanical name, Araucaria Bidwili, does not give him the credit. In 1842, in company with Mr. Henry Stuart Russell, the Honourable Mr. Risley and others, Mr. Petrie explored the Mary River, which had not before been entered by a boat, and it was while on this expedition that he discovered and brought back to civilization the well-known Durham boy, who had been living in a kind of semi-captivity with the blacks for 14 years. While on one of these exploratory journeys, and once subsequently, Mr. Petrie ascended to the summit of the almost inaccessible beer wall, the highest of the Glasshouse Mountains, from whence he took bearings for the assistance of the surveyors who were then commencing a trigonometrical survey. On the latter occasion, Mr. Petrie and his companions struck across the country to Kilcoy, which had then been formed as a station for about three days by Sir Evan Mackenzie. On his way back to Brisbane, Mr. Petrie met and camped with Mr. David Archer, who was then looking for country on the site of the present at Durunda Station. Soon after the settlement was thrown open in 1842, the Governor Sir George Gibbs visited the settlement in company with Colonel Barney, and the latter endeavoured to persuade Mr. Petrie to return to Sydney, as his office was abolished, but that gentleman preferred remaining here, and trying his chances in what he foresaw would be a flourishing colony. In 1848, while on a trip to the Downs, he suffered severely from an ophthalmic attack, the treatment for which resulted in the loss of his eyesight, and in the same year another calamity befell him in the loss of his son Walter, who was drowned in the creek which crosses Queen Street. Singularly enough, Mr. John Petrie lost a son of the same name in the same creek some years afterwards. Although thus deprived of one of nature's most valued senses, the deceased gentleman continued for years to assist in the superintendence of buildings and other works, and many residents will remember, even of late years, his daily visits to works in progress. During the last few years, however, Mr. Petrie's activity of mind had to succumb to infirmity of body, and he was seldom able to leave his own premises. Up to two years ago, blind as he was, he rang the workman's bell with his own hands every morning, and was made acquainted with the details of the business of which he had been the founder. Mr. Petrie was not a man to obtrude himself upon public notice, but although he never actively interfered in political and other movements, he could express his views decidedly and vigorously in private. As a father, he was kind and indulgent. As an employer, he was respected though strict and watchful. And as a friend and companion, he was genial and hearty. Nothing pleasing him better than a chat about old times. Surrounded by all the surviving members of his family and by a goodly number of grandchildren, he passed peacefully away on the afternoon of 20th February on that last journey in search of final rest which all humanity must one day undertake. The funeral of the late Mr. Andrew Petrie, which took place yesterday afternoon, was one of the largest which has been seen in Brisbane for many years past. The greatest respect was shown for the deceased by all classes in the community. The flags of all the vessels in the river were half-mast high, a number of mercantile establishments were entirely closed, while others partially relinquished business in the afternoon. The cortege moved from the late residence of the deceased at Petrie's Bight at about four o'clock and the procession extended over half a mile in length. After the hearse came four mourning coaches, then nearly 60 followers on foot, 55 carriages and upwards of 50 horsemen. Amongst those present were Sir James Cockle, Chief Justice Sir Maurice O'Connell, the Honourable Colonel Secretary, the Honourable Colonel Treasurer, several members of the Legislature, and the Mayor and Aldermen, and many other gentlemen holding important positions in the colony. The funeral service was read by Reverend E. Griffith and Reverend C. Og. In portioning out and directing what work the better class of prisoners had to do, my grandfather travelled about a good deal. He watched to see that the buildings put up were done correctly, and he visited different places such as Ipswich, Limestone and Dunwich, Lurgan River, Amity Point for the pilot station, etc. He went to Ipswich to see how the government sheep and cattle under the management of Mr. George Thorne were doing, also to inspect the lime kiln worked by the prisoners there. To take him about he had a whaleboat manned by a crew of prisoners, 
Tom recollects well one trip his father made to Limestone with this boat. On this occasion, as an outing for them, grandfather took his wife and two or three kiddies, my father included. The child of those days has memories of how they carried a tent with them in the boat, and how stopping when they came to the first batch of government sawyers at work on the river, he was carried ashore by one of the boat's crew, then afterwards the men fixed up the tent for his father. Next day they went on again up the river to Limestone, where they stayed a couple of days at Mr Thorne's house, while the head of the expedition made his inspections. At that time Limestone, Ipswich, consisted of Mr Thorne's house and the yards for the cattle and sheep, also the lime kiln and the stockade for the prisoners. On the return journey to Brisbane, Mr Petrie called in at all the places where men were at work on the river. Not only on the Brisbane, but on the Alward and Logan rivers, the government prisoners worked soaring cedar. Then they burnt mangrove trees for ash for soap making at the mouth of the Brisbane. Mr Petrie inspected these places with his whaleboat, as he also now and then visited Dunwich to see that the prisoners there were all right, and also that the cedar timber was loaded on the vessels for Sydney. At other times he took a survey of the bay and the surroundings of the different parts of the water there. On the return from one of these trips of inspection to Dunwich, Tom remembers his father bringing a black fellow back with him to the hospital with a fearful wound. The man's name was Parapunyi, and he had been fighting with another black fellow who had become possessed of a razor. In the fight, the razor had made a fearful gash from the small of Parapunyi's back round to the flank, letting some of the inner parts out. Mr. Petrie heard of the event soon after it happened, and he went and had the man's wound attended to and sewn up and then took him in the boat to Brisbane, where in the hospital he very soon recovered. It is wonderful how the black's flesh would heal so quickly. Another time, an incident of the same sort happened in Queen Street, opposite where the Bank of New South Wales now stands. Two blacks were fighting there, and as at Dunwich, one of them, Murki, had a razor in his hand, and the other man, Kibi, was wounded in much the same way as Barpunyi. In this case, however, there was no hospital, but the man pushed the protruding parts in, and holding them so with both hands, walked off to camp, which was near to the present Roma Street Station. There he had to lie on his back, and the blacks put very fine charcoal and ashes in the wound, and that was all the doctoring he got. He had to keep on his back for a long time, but in the end recovered all right, though the wound left a very large scar. My father, who went to see the black several times during his enforced quietude, says that a white man so doctored would not have lived. The man told the boy that the wound did not pain him much then. End of part two, chapter one. Recording by Dean Rogers. Section 26 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dean Rogers Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland Part 2, Chapter 2 We in these days can hardly imagine Brisbane without horses and drays and carts and traps of all sorts. But at the first, when my father was a little chap, there were none. One comical conveyance he remembers well. It was an old spring cart with a cover on it, drawn by a black and white poly bullock yoked in shafts as a horse would be, and driven by a prisoner called Tom Brooks. This turnout belonged to the government, and was used to convey the prisoner's dirty clothes to the women convicts at Eagle Farm each week to be washed. Two or three times when Mr Petrie went out to inspect these quarters at Eagle Farm, he took his wife and children, making a picnic of the trip. They all drove in the grand buggy drawn by Tinker the Bullock. On these occasions, old Tom Brooks, the driver, would walk alongside and lead the bullock, but when carting the clothes, he sat in the buggy and drove as though the animal were a horse. Sometimes Tom's brother John, being a bigger boy, would accompany old Brooks when he went with the clothes and considered it a great honour to drive Tinker. On the picnic occasions, the party always stopped at the end of the road to boil the kettle. There were no billies in those days, and to give Tinker a rest. The halting place was past Breakfast Creek on the riverbank where the iceworks were afterwards built. There was a spring there, and it was a nice place to rest. This road, which is the present Hamilton Road, had formerly been made by the women prisoners. Looking at the cutting now, it seems impossible to realise this. Of course it has been extended since. 
A Dr. Simpson had charge of these prisoners at Eagle Farm about the years 1840 to 1841. In his cottage, he had a little room off the kitchen containing a sofa, table, and some chairs. Here, he was in the habit of retiring for an after dinner smoke and rest. On one occasion, when young Tom had accompanied his father and mother to Eagle Farm, he happened to go into the doctor's kitchen and saw there a man cook with a large Indian pipe. The youngster watched the man and saw him place the bowl on a little shelf on the side of the wall next to the doctor's room, then noticed him put the stem, which was two or three feet long, through a little hole in the wall. This made the boy very inquisitive as to what would happen next, and he watched more intently. The cook then filled the big pipe with tobacco and put a red hot coal on this, and Tom, dodging round the doorway, saw the doctor from where he lay on the sofa in the next room take hold of the stem and putting the end in his mouth, calmly start to puff. This was intensely interesting of course, and Tom thought it very funny the way the doctor enjoyed his after dinner smoke. Dr. Simpson also smoked cigars at that time, and in after years he evidently gave up the long pipe, for he was known never to use anything but a cigar. Some notes read this gentleman kindly sent by a reliable correspondent may be of interest. When Dr. Simpson was a young man, he was in the army in Ireland. Whether as a surgeon or as a private or otherwise, I do not remember. He studied as a doctor in Edinburgh, but was an Englishman. He was employed by two ladies of the royal family of Russia to travel with them from St. Petersburg through Europe to Rome, etc. and back. He studied homeopathy, or rather that system of curing diseases, under Hahnemann, a German, the originator of that system, and was remarkably successful in effecting cures. He was employed as a doctor for the children by the Duchess of Devonshire. He wrote the first book in the English language on homeopathy, and the doctors were so offended at it that they persecuted him out of the country. He informed the Duchess of Devonshire of his resolution, and she was sorry to lose his services, and told him if she could assist in any way, she would do it. He came to Sydney and then got permission from the government to come to Brisbane, then a convict colony. Making it a free settlement was talked of, and officers, police magistrate and commissioner of Crown Lands would be required. He then used the influence of the Duchess of Devonshire, and that put him wherever he wished. He took the commissioner for Crown Lands, but had to act for some time as police magistrate. Dr. Simpson had the reputation of being very clever at curing illnesses in those early days of Brisbane. My father remembers him well, also his friend, W. H. Wiseman. A writer in a South Brisbane paper recently speaking of the convict days says, It is only just to say there were bright reliefs in this dark outlining, old hands named with gratitude, Dr. Simpson, a medical officer, afterwards a resident of Goodner, and the chaplains of the penal times as their best friends. Commandant Cotton was considered their best governor. Mr. Andrew Petrie Sr., foreman of works, had won all their hearts. They never tried praising these good men. Let the present time fully honor their memories as lights shining in a dark place. The better class of prisoners were not hobbled as the chain gang were, but they worked in a place called the Lumberyard, which stood where the Longreach Hotel is now. This was a walled enclosure containing different buildings where the prisoners worked at trades of every description they made their own clothes, caps and boots, and kept the chain gang supplied with these also. Then they made the nails and iron bolts etc. required for buildings. They tanned leather and made all the soap and candles needed for the settlement. Also there were blacksmiths, carpenters, cabinet makers, coopers, wheelwrights, barbers etc. The brick wall surrounding this place was high, with one opening, the gate facing Queen Street. Close to this gate on the outside there was a sentry box, where the soldier who kept the gate could retire if it came on to rain. This soldier had to march up and down in front of the gate to prevent any escape, and after so many hours he was relieved by another man, and so on through the day till about six o'clock, when half a dozen or eight redcoats arrived with their sergeant, then the overseer, a head prisoner, would muster the men, and placing them in rows would call out their names to see if any were missing after which they were all marched out of the gate and down to the barracks which stood a few yards above Messrs. Chapman and Company's establishment. The overseer, or jailer, then searched each man before locking him up in order to ascertain that he had no tobacco or anything on his person. Tom often went with his father to the lumber yard when a boy. He can remember events of those days better than he can happenings of 12 months ago. The prisoners had a cook amongst them, who cooked each man's food for him. Twice a week, tea and sugar and meat were doled out. Meat was divided in the following fashion. 
It was cut up into equal chunks, as many small pieces as there were men, and placed on a bench ready. Then one prisoner was blindfolded and put in a corner, while another stood by the meat, the rest waiting in a row. The man near the meat touched a piece with his finger, calling, Who for this? And the blindfolded prisoner made answer with one of the waiting men's names, the owner of which then went forward and took his piece. So it went on until all was finished. This was done that there might be no grumbling about more bone in one piece than another, and all seemed satisfied with the arrangement. Besides this tea and sugar and meat twice a week, the prisoners daily were fed on rough corn meal porridge. This was served out in kids, small wooden tubs like cheese vats but shallow, which held about two quarts of the mixture, flavoured with salt but of course eaten without milk. The chain gang got nothing but this hominy three times a day. My father says that some of them looked fatter and stronger than those with the extras. Though Grandfather Petrie had nothing to do with how the chain gang were treated, his young son Tom, as might be supposed, often came into contact with them. He has seen about 300 of these men march from the barracks down to where Messrs Campbell and Sons Warehouse now stands. They worked from here towards the government gardens, chipping corn and hilling it, and the soldiers kept guard to see that no one ran away. As soon as the men arrived on the ground, they all pulled off their shirts before starting to work. Father has heard them say that this was in order to keep these upper garments clean. They worked away with only their trousers and caps and boots on, and their bodies were all tanned with the sun. You would see, says Father, the poor fellow's backs marked with the lash, some not quite healed from the last flogging. They had each so many yards to get through before time to knock off came. Some would finish beforehand, and these would be allowed to sit down and rest, but now and again one would not get through in time, and he was therefore flogged. A pine tree stood on the bank of the river, 100 yards up from where the stream ferry now lands its passengers, and to this tree these prisoners were tied to be flogged. Though my father has many a time seen men flogged in Queen Street, he does not remember the scene at this pine tree but often the little chaps sat and listened to the prisoners as they rested and told stories of how they had been treated in Logan's time. They pointed out to the boy the tree where the floggings took place for unfinished work or for an answer to an overseer. The overseers were picked prisoners and they were generally cruel men who would report everything to the commandant in order to gain favor. They had freedom to go about without a guard watching them and they were kept apart from the others as they ran a risk of being murdered for their cruelty. Father has often heard the prisoners say that it was awful the way they were treated in Logan's time, and they thought it a blessing when his end came, for they then had better times. The blacks, they remarked, got the credit of the murder, but they themselves knew he did it, and was all right for he deserved his death. The chain gang was generally divided up into lots who worked at New Farm, Kangaroo Point, South Brisbane from Turbot Street along the river towards Roma Street Station and from the present steam ferry at Creek Street along the river to the Government Gardens. Mostly the work they did here was to hoe the ground and plant and heal corn. Father has often seen the convicts cultivating the ground about Brisbane and it was all done by hoe, no plough. I have seen, he says, the poor fellows march with chains on their legs to their work at New Farm and back again on each cultivated part when the corn was in cob. A prisoner was put to keep away the crows and the cockatoos. He was dubbed the crow minder, and he had what was called a clapper to make a noise to frighten these birds. This clapper was made of three pieces of board, two about seven inches long and four inches wide, and the third some six inches longer, which was shaped like a butter pat with a handle. The two shorter pieces were fastened one on either side of the long one by a piece of cord or string put through the holes made in the boards, and when this affair was held in the hand and shaken about, it made a great noise. The man was supposed to walk up and down through the corn, shaking this for the benefit, or rather otherwise, of the crows who came inquiring. These crow minders were prisoners under short sentence, and they were not chained like the others. The man who watched the land running along the river from Creek Street was called Andy, and he had a hut built up in the fork of a gum tree on the bank of the river, down a little way from the pine tree already mentioned. This gum tree had steps made of pieces of iron, driven in like Sawyer's dogs, and it was called the Crowminder's Tree. Andy used to climb up to his hut and watch that the blacks did not swim across from Kangaroo Point, or come in a canoe to steal the corn or sweet potatoes. The blacks were very daring in those days. 
and he had an old flint pistol which he fired off to give the alarm when the darkies appeared. The hut was a protection from them, and when up in it, he could keep any number off. The crowminder at New Farm had a similar tree and hut, stood on the riverbank near where the residence of Sir Samuel Griffith now stands. Father has often gone out amongst the corn with Andy while the clapping was going on. The boy was told in those days that once in Logan's time, when Kangaroo Point was under a crop of corn, the blacks were very troublesome. Nothing seemed to prevent them from stealing. So one was shot and skinned and stuffed and put up amongst the corn to frighten the rest. It turned out a good cure. The corn wasn't troubled afterwards. Whether this was true or not, my father does not know. But he was told it as a fact many a time. End of part two, chapter two. Recording by Dean Rogers. Section 27 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. Part 2, Chapter 3 Andy had an instrument he called a fiddle, made in the shape of a grater from a piece of tin, with holes punched in it with the end of a file and nailed on to a piece of flooring board. This he used to grate down cobs of corn for meal to cook and eat on the slime. If he were caught at this, he would be flogged, he said. He had a small bag in which he carried this meal. In those days, the creek which ran down Creek Street existed, of course, and a bridge spanning it opposite Messrs. Campbell and Sons' warehouse entered with its northern end the Petrie's Garden. Under this part of the bridge there was a nice flat bank, which always kept dry as the tide did not reach it, and here Andy used to cook his maize meal and the other eatables he got hold of. Tom, with his brothers Andrew and Walter, used to take him tea with sugar and flour on the quiet, and one boy kept guard while the cooking was going on, so that Andy would not be taken unawares and flogged. In this out-of-the-way place, the prisoner made round things which passed as doughboys, and when the peaches were ripe, the youngsters brought him some from their father's garden, which he stewed and cooked up. This garden, which I have before mentioned, often contained lots of fruit. Mr. Knight speaks of it in his book as a large area of cultivation with groves of luxuriant orange, lemon, lime, and guava trees. The boys thought Andy's cooking far better than what they got at home, and when they watched him and then joined in the eating part, everything tasted most delightfully sweet and delicious. Stolen waters are sweet, I suppose. Many a time Tom's mother gave her boys tea and sugar, and meat and bread for the prisoners, unknown to anyone else. It was against the rules, of course. And through her intercession, the prisoners afterwards used to say they were saved many a punishment. Grandfather himself, though kind, was strict, but yet during all his reign, according to his son Tom, he never had one man flogged. He used to threaten them whenever he caught them doing anything wrong, my father says. Then, after a little, would think no more about it. He always carried a walking stick, and when going into any of the workshops in the lumber yard, never forgot to make a noise on the floor with this stick. The prisoners hearing knew who was coming, and had time to put anything aside and be on their best behaviour. They used to make little tubs and other things on the sly for the soldiers, and these were smuggled out by means of the sentry, and in exchange tobacco was smuggled in. The prisoners were not allowed to smoke, so if they got hold of a pipe of tobacco, they hid them in their workshops and waited a chance, or some of them preferred chewing the tobacco. The plant known as the tobacco plant came up and grew like a weed on all the cultivated ground in those days. Whether the seed was originally set or not, my father does not know. It grew in the Petrie's garden, and old Ned the gardener used to make tobacco from the leaves. He proceeded in this way. After drying the plant well, he took all the big stalks from the leaves and boiled them in a pot for a certain time with some water and black sugar. In those days sugar was black and no mistake. When this mixture was cold, he soaked the leaves in it for a while, then taking them out, folded them into a square flat cake, and wrapping a cloth, also wet in the juice, around this cake, he put it between two flat heavy stones and left it to become pressed. The prisoners in the lumber yard also made tobacco in this way. 
father says, I have many a time taken the leaf to them on the sly from our garden and have seen them make the tobacco, sometimes pressing the cake in a vice instead of between stones. Sometimes the chain gang got hold of a piece of tobacco made like this, but very seldom. They got it through the crow minder, who would bury a piece for them in the field where their work lay with the corn. He hid it in a certain place and marked the spot that it might be easily found. At night, when they were all shut up together, he would tell them about this, and next day when they went to work they had no trouble in finding it. The bother was to smoke it, for the only chance was the dinner hour, when the overseers were away for an hour or so. There would very likely be only one pipe among a dozen of them, so one man filled it and lit the precious object and had a few drawers, then passed it on to another man, and so on, till all had had a turn. It went from one to another till finished just as the black honey rag did in camp. The soldiers looked on and said nothing so long as the overseers were away. Father has often sat with the convicts while they indulged in this sort of smoke, and seeing their enjoyment was what first made him learn the habit when quite a tiny chap. He used even to make tobacco in their way for his own use. Captain Logan met his death in 1830, and my grandfather arrived in Brisbane in 1837, so the latter's son, Tom, did not witness the worst of the convict's sufferings. However, the sights he saw were bad enough. Many a time he has seen members of the chain gang flogged in Queen Street, in the old archway at the prisoner's barracks. They got from 50 to 200 lashes at a time. They were stripped naked and tied to the triangle by hands and feet, so that they could not move. Some were flogged for a very small offence, and on the backs of others were unhealed marks of a previous flogging. The rest of the prisoners were arranged round in order to get the benefit of the sight, and a doctor stood by in case the unfortunate fainted. Then the punishment began, and as each stroke fell, the chief constable counted along the number. Out of all those he has seen flogged, father does not remember even one man fainting, though sometimes the blood flew out at every lash. Some poor wretches cried aloud in their agony for mercy, or to their mothers and friends to save them. Others cursed and swore at the flogger and all the officials, and others again remained perfectly still and quiet. At times the lash went too far round the side of the victim's body, and as it hurt more then, he swore and called the flogger to hit fair on the back. In Logan's time, a man called Old Bumble was the flogger. He was an inhuman wretch from all accounts, and was hated by the prisoners. The man who succeeded him was Gilligan, the flogger, and my father remembers this man once being flogged himself. Gilligan was the commandant's gardener, and lived apart from the other prisoners in a little hut near his work, where he cooked his own meals of hominy, and the vegetables he was allowed from the garden. The commandant's quarters were situated where the new lands office is being built now, and his garden extended down along the riverbank. It was a nice one, well laid out and well kept, and contained vegetables of all sorts, also fruit trees and flowers galore. Once Gilligan was caught doing something very wrong in the eyes of the law, and he was tried, found guilty, and sentenced to 100 lashes. The day for his punishment was fixed, but it was found difficult to get a prisoner to volunteer to flog him. However, at last, a black man named Punch, from the Isle of France, came forward. Father remembers the incident well, and can almost now see Gilligan brought forth from the cells and stripped and tied to the triangles. Then a number of other prisoners were marched up and placed in line to look on, and the chief constable, Fitzpatrick, stood close by to count the strokes aloud, while another constable jotted them down with a pencil on a piece of paper. The doctor was also there. When the word was given, Punch, who was left-handed, was ready with his shirt off and the cat in his left hand. He flourished it round his head and came down so severely that blood showed the first time, and got worse afterwards, and Gilligan cried out for the mercy which was not shown. Indeed, the prisoners stood round grinning with delight to see the man who had so often flogged them getting it himself. Punch hit nearly always on the same place, which grew raw, and his unfortunate victim was covered with blood from shoulder to heel at the finish. Some five months after this, Punch got into trouble and was sentenced to 50 lashes. Now was Gilligan's revenge. Father remembers how Punch's black skin shone when he was stripped and tied up, and how Gilligan rolled up his sleeves and spat on his handle of the cat so that it would not slip. 
but the hit he gave only made a brown mark on the man's dark skin, and even at the end very little blood came. His skin was too thick for Gillian. The latter's shirt was wringing wet with perspiration, and one could see he tried his best to give it hard to punch, who, however, stood all like a brick and made no sound nor movement, though his back was well marked. The prisoners standing by understood, and they seemed to enjoy the fun. Sometime after this, Punch ran away and got into the bush, and the poor fellow's body was found floating on the bremer by John Petrie on his way to Limestone. It was supposed he took cramps while swimming across the river. In those days, there was a prisoner among the others who made baskets for the government called Bribey the Basket Maker. He was not chained and was allowed to go about in a boat to get cane from the scrubs for his work. He only had a short sentence and it was not worth his while to run away. Indeed, if any of these prisoners with liberty to go and come attempted escape or misbehave, they were put back into the chain gang, and it was known too well what that meant. Some who worked in batches, like the Sawyers, had an overseer, also a prisoner, always with them, and he reported behaviour. It was from this man Bribey, my father thinks, that Bribey Island got its name. He cannot remember distinctly on this point, but has some vague recollection of a connection between the man and the island. Whether he was blown ashore there or what, he does not know. At the mouth of the creek which formerly ran up Creek Street, just where the steam ferry landing is now, a place was built by the prisoners for the catching of fish and crabs. Two beams were put side by side across from bank to bank at high water mark, and they were flat on top, so that one could walk on them. Between these beams, slabs were supported, which extended down into the mud. They were close together, but in the middle an opening was left about six feet wide, which was bound by two piles standing some nine feet across the beams. These piles were joined across the top with a piece of timber, and this had a ring bolt in the centre for a block and tackle, by which a light framework made of wood was worked up and down. To this framework was attached a large basket, Bribey's handiwork, made so that the fish and crabs which entered were caught, and it had a square hole with a cover on top by which they could be taken out. When the water was high and just on the turn, the basket was lowered. Then when the tide had gone down, it was hoisted up level with the beams. Fish were plentiful in the river then, there being nothing much to disturb them, and sometimes the basket contained a great supply. Old shank bones with a little meat attached were thrown into the creek to encourage the fish to come in, and the basket trap was only worked two or three times a week so that the fish did not grow afraid, having several days of undisturbed comings and goings. A prisoner had charge of the working of this trap, and he took the fish caught to the Commandant, Mr Andrew Petrie, and all the other officials in turn. Just at the corner of Elizabeth and Albert Streets, where a public house now stands, there used to be a large building erected for holding and thrashing the maize grown by the prisoners. This barn was built with walls of tea tree logs notched into one another, the roof was thatched with blady grass, and it had a wooden floor. Bags were nailed all round the walls to prevent grain flying through the openings when the corn was thrashed. The thrashing was done by six men at a time working in pairs, each man with a flail, and they kept very good time, swinging their instruments round their heads and coming down one after the other on the cobs, hit for hit. Other prisoners shoveled the corn up, and sifting it in sieves, put it into bags ready for cartage to the windmill, where it was ground into meal. Alongside this barn, a short sentence prisoner lived in a hut. He was a sort of clerk, and kept books which showed the quantity of grain coming and going. The corn in cobs was taken from the fields to the barn in what was called a handcart. These carts were something after the style of a small dray with low wheels, and a pole instead of shafts. Each pole had two bars across, one at the end and another three feet from it, and four prisoners dragged the cart, two on either side of the pole holding to the bars. The bars reached about to the men's waists, who as they walked, thus pulled the cart. Other two prisoners helped by shoving, and a red coat walked along behind with a gun on his shoulder, the bayonet shining brightly in the sun. Thus the poor fellows, chained as they were, had to drag the empty carts down to the riverbank where the corn grew, then, after loading up, they dragged them back to the barn. When full, the carts held nearly as much as a dray would, and generally four of them were kept busy, two going and two coming when the corn was ripe. As they passed, 
one would hear the click click of the chains on the prisoner's legs. Sometimes these hand carts were utilised for carrying the grain from the barn to the windmill, but mostly bullock drays were used for that purpose. End of section 27. Section 28 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, Part 2, Chapter 4. The windmill, the present observatory, much altered, of course, is said to have been erected in 1829. It was built for the purpose of grinding the maize grown by the prisoners into meal. But there was something very wrong with the machinery, evidently, for the wind would not move the fans round in a decent fashion. For years, everything thought of was tried to alter this defect. Even the ground round about was cleared of its heavy timber, so that the wind would have fair play but all to no purpose. However, the maize was ground in spite of all, for the mill was turned into a treadmill, and by way of punishment, the prisoners' legs had to do the work the wind refused to perform. Mr. Knight in his book says, quote, The year 1837 marked two important events in the early history of Brisbane, the arrival of the Petries, and of the first steamer which ploughed the waters of Morton Bay." End quote. Mr. Andrew Petrie, who before his departure from Sydney was attached to the Royal Engineers there, examined the windmill on his arrival, at once discovered the fault of the machinery and had it put to rights, so after that the mill could do its own work. But still the treads were used as a punishment for the badly behaved prisoners, and at these times the corn was ground by double power. It was no light punishment, as many a prisoner could tell to his cost, especially a heavily ironed man, poor wretch. My father remembers a time in those days when the vessel which came from Sydney with supplies for the settlement was a long time overdue and it was thought she must be wrecked. Tea and sugar and flour and a number of other things were scarce on account of her non-arrival. Here it may be mentioned that the tea then was all green tea and very coarse, like bits of stick. Indeed, it was christened posts and rails. The sugar the prisoners called coal tar for it was almost black like tar. I do not know, Father says, what the people of today would say if they had to live on such stuff. They would think their last hour had come, but we all lived and kept in good health. One thing which was grand, according to him, however, was boiled pumpkin and sweet potatoes, mashed and mixed together and then baked in the oven in the shape of a sugar loaf, alongside a piece of roast beef. Another idea was sweet potatoes mixed with cornmeal and made into cakes. Then they used to roast the Indian corn in a pan and grind it to make coffee sweetened with the coal tar. To return to the overdue vessel. In order to gain a good supply of meal to make up for the other things, Grandfather Petrie got the better class of prisoners to volunteer to work the treadmill as it was calm weather, no wind to speak of, and the mill was slow in its work. The prisoners did not object, as it meant plenty to eat for themselves as well as for the rest of the settlement. The boy Tom marched alongside the convicts up to the mill, and when there, he saw them go in turns to the wheel so many on at a time. It was a very hot day, and the first lot took off their shirts. 
and then went up some five steps to get onto the wheel, which was like a water wheel, and was 30 or 40 feet long, and the treads being about nine inches wide. An iron bolt at one end held it steady till the prisoners were on, then when that was withdrawn, the weight of the men started it moving, and they simply had to step up or be hit on the shins. They had a rail to hold on by, of course. A shaft ran through from the wheel into the windmill, where it connected with the cog wheels there. The works were something like those of a chart cutter. To look at the convict stepping, one would think they were going upstairs. They had to tread so many minutes, and when one man got off at the far end, another one took his place at the starting point. The man just off would have a rest till his turn came round again. Some took to it so well that they could just hold on with the left hand as they stepped, and with the right scribble on the boards of drawings of ships, animals and men. Others seemed to tire altogether. However, on this occasion it was not a punishment and most of them were very jolly over it, shouting one another and saying, Hello, Bill, or Jack, what have you done to be put on the treadmill? So they went on till plenty of meal was ground to keep things going and a couple of days later the expected vessel turned up. She had been windbound in some bay on the coast. Father also saw the unfortunate chained men on the treadmill working out their punishment. You would hear the click, click of their irons as they kept step with the wheel. And those with the heavier irons seemed to have a great job to keep up. Some poor wretches only just managed to pull through till they got off at the far end. Then they sat down till their turn came to go on again. They all had to do so many hours according to their sentence. An overseer kept the time, and a couple of soldiers guarded them. When they had put in their time, they were marched back to the barracks. The leg irons for the chain gang were made in the lumber yard by a blacksmith prisoner there. A supply was kept always on hand, some light and some heavy. And when the prisoner was sentenced to wear them for a certain time, he was taken to this blacksmith's shop to be fitted up. Then, when his sentence had expired, he was sent there to have them taken off again. Father has many a time watched both performances. The rings, which went round the man's ankle, were made in two half circles the size of the leg. The ends flattened, having holes punched in them for rivets. One end was riveted loosely so that it could act as a hinge. Then the man, standing near a small anvil, put out his foot and the blacksmith fitted the iron on and riveted the other end. He then tightened the loose one. When both legs were fixed up, a piece of leather made round like the top of a boot was put in between the iron and the man's leg so that the skin would not be so readily chafed. When the irons were taken off, the rivets were cut through with a cold chisel. The lighter irons had links about the size of a plough chain, the others being much heavier. The chains were some two feet long between the legs and in the middle of each was a small ring with a string through it, which being connected to the prisoner's belt, kept the irons from dragging on the ground during motion. Prisoners wearing chains had a peculiar way of walking, and you would see the poor fellows just released after six months or so, going along as though they still wore them. Heavily chained men always dragged their feet along in a weary fashion. Life to them could not have been much joy Ordinary trousers would not go over a man's irons, so the chain gang all wore their garments open right down the outside seams and buttoned there with big black buttons. At that time Tom was the youngest son of the Petrie family, and there being of course no school to go to, 
His father used to take him two or three days in the week to the lumber yard to his office, there to get lessons from his clerk. This clerk was a prisoner and he was called Pegleg Kelly because he had a wooden leg. But grandfather himself said he was a very good scholar. He kept books for the lumber yard and could tell from them what the prisoners made and everything that was done in the yard. Also all the prisoners' names, why they were sent out and the length of their sentence, etc. Father says, I have often heard my father say that some of the poor fellows got 15 or 16 years for stealing turnips. Others were sentenced for life because they had stolen sheep or for forgery. Nowadays, for the same offence or worse, they pay a fine or in a few months in jail, where they're kept like gentlemen with everything they want. And very often, the moment time is up, something is done to get back again. If they were treated as the prisoners in the early days, they would not be so anxious to get in again, but would turn honest, even as the convicts did. Those poor fellows, when once they got free, could be trusted with almost anything. Very little in the way of lessons, my father says he learnt in those days. So soon as his father left the office and went from the lumber yard to inspect the outside works, Tom was off out among the prisoners, watching them as they made nails and all the other various articles, without a thought to his lessons. Poor Kelly, he says, could never tell on me, although I used to get many a thrashing from father for not knowing my lessons, and Kelly got many a scolding for not getting me along better. He would never split on me. I used to take him now to get a bit of tobacco and a little tea and sugar or a piece of bread, all unknown to father, and sometimes I gave the other prisoners some, so that I was a great favourite among them, and no matter what I did, they never let it out. I have often thought since that if I had taken poor father's advice and stuck to my lessons, it would have been better for me today. But I only thought of playing in those days, and though I had, of course, no opportunity to become what my father was, the few poor chances which came in my way were passed unrecognised. Just at this time, myself and brothers, John, Andrew and Walter, were the only boys in the settlement, with the one exception of the barracks sergeant's son. Of course, later on, there were lots of youngsters. This boy, Billy Jones, was not allowed in among the prisoners, and we were really not supposed to be there unless we went with our father. My brothers, like myself, were in great favour with the convicts, as they used also to bring food and tobacco to them. The prisoners would do anything for us. A convict called Joe Goosey, an on-job man, was much disliked by the others because he told tales about them. He would never grow any sign of whiskers, and for this reason, and because he wore small silver rings in his ears, he was jeered at and called the lady. The convicts could not stand a tell-tale at any price, and poor Joe Goosey, a soft sort of fellow, had anything but a pleasant life among them. But even he had no complaints to make of the Petrie youngsters. The building where the prisoners slept, the barracks, was divided up into wards for the different classes. The chain gang occupied one, and so on. The beds the poor fellows had to lie on were merely movable boards six feet long and two feet wide and these were supported by ledges, one higher than the other, so as to cause a slant from the head downwards to the feet. Also at the higher end, a piece of timber rounded off and nailed there served as a pillow. Add to this a double blanket and we had the one-time convict's feather bed. In the centre part of the barracks was a room used as a church, and here service was held every Sunday. This room was afterwards used as the Supreme Court. 
the chain gang always clanked upstairs to the gallery while the mechanics sat below. The barracks, as I have said, were situated a little above Mrs. Chapman and Company's warehouse and further down from the bridge on the right-hand side of the corner of Queen and Albert Streets, the stockyard once stood, used by the prisoners for yoking up the working bullocks. Then on the bank of the river, opposite the present iceworks, the government saw pits stood, and at Roma Street Station in the hollow there, the convicts made the bricks. When my father was nine or ten years old, he saw the first execution by hanging in Brisbane, that of two aboriginals who were found guilty of the murder of the surveyors, Stapleton and Tuck. The execution took place at the windmill, which was fixed up for the occasion. After it was over, a prisoner, taking young Tom by the hand, drew him along to have a look in the coffin. Stooping, he pulled the white cap from the face of the dead black fellow, exposing the features. The eyes were staring, and the open mouth had the tongue protruding from it. The horror of this ghastly sight so frightened the child that it set him crying, and he could not get over it nor forget it for long afterwards. As a man, he remembers it still. While talking of these days, I may mention the story told of the planting of prepared rice. This was done in Logan's time by Mr. Peter Spicer the superintendent of convicts. My father has often heard his father laughing and telling the tale as a joke to the early squatters. The land prepared for the rice was a swamp, which extended from Belimba to Newstead, and doubtless there are those who remember the drains on this land. After all the trouble, because the rice did not come up, the land was declared to be unsuitable for the growing of that crop. End of section 28。section 29 of Tom Petrie's reminiscences of early Queensland。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org。Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, Part 2, Chapter 5 It has, of course, been recorded how in 1838 Mr. Andrew Petrie got lost in the bush with the then new commandant, Major Cotton. They went out on a visit of inspection to Limestone, accompanied by Dr. Alexander, the medical officer to the 28th Regiment, an orderly and a convict attendant. Travelling up by boat, they reached Limestone, Ipswich, without event, and on the return trip Mr. Petrie suggested to the Commandant that they should journey through the bush to Redbank to see the sheep station formed there. This was done, and on the way some new specimens of timber were discovered by my grandfather, whose taste for exploring was therefore aroused, and he again proposed a lengthening of the trip. This time it was to Oxley Creek, where convict sawyers were at work. All went well until, after leaving the latter place, the party got bushed in the thick forest in an attempt to come out on the river, where they had instructed the boat to wait for them. The boat did wait, and waited till her occupants grew weary, then went on to the settlement to report the new turn events had taken, and search parties were sent out. In the meantime, the lost sheep wandered about for a couple of days and nights. Then, on the third day, coming to a mountain, Mr. Petrie ascended it, hoping to be able to see then where they were. He was successful, and they managed after that to find their way to the river, coming out near the present Lytton. Here my grandfather, he could not swim, proceeded to make a raft of dry logs to cross the river, but while in the midst of this, one of the search parties with a black tracker came up, and immediately after a boat belonging to the government happened to pass, which took the exhausted party back to the settlement. A good deal of excitement was caused over this event, 
for it was thought that the travelers had met with Logan's fate, guns being fired and black trackers employed for so long, all without result. The search party which had come up with the lost ones while the raft was being made told them how the black man, Tallingalini, had followed their tracks. He seemed to know grandfathers from the others, and once, coming on a certain place, called, Look here, Mr. Petrobin stand and shoot bird, and proceeded to show the way that gentleman had fired off the gun, standing with it to his left shoulder. Mr. Petri always held the gun so, but was nevertheless a good shot. He thought it wonderful how the black man had noticed, for it was quite true. He had shot the swamp pheasant that the place described. Tom often heard his father speak of this time afterwards, saying how strange it was that the tracker should know the position in which he stood, and declaring that the swamp pheasant was very sweet, but hardly a mouthful among them all. They were tired and very hungry. The hill from which Mr. Petri found his bearings as regards the Brisbane River was afterwards called Mount Petri, a name it still is known by. With reference to this some years ago, the Brisbane Courier contained the following. Mr. Thorne drew the attention of the Belmont Board at Wednesday's meeting to the fact that there was a tree lying on the summit of Mount Petri, Mr. Crowd's property, which bore a relic of the early days. The tree had a scarf cut out, and in its place there was carved the name A. Petri, 1838. This was the father of Mr. T. Petri of North Pine, and the grandfather of the present member for Tumbo. Mr. Thorne thought the relic ought to be in the museum, and for this purpose moved that Mr. Prout be written to asking permission to cut and remove the portion of the tree referred to. Mr. Lees seconded the motion which was unanimously agreed to. A trigonometrical station was built on Mount Petri, and Mr. Andrew Petri's tree was cut down to make room for the beacon. In 1896, when the board saw the tree, it had just been burnt by bushfires. The writer is indebted to Mr. Lees for a rough sketch of the tree while standing. In Mr. Andrew Petrie's explorations, he found many new specimens of timber. Says Dr. Lang on page 135 of his book, Cook's Land, I shall enumerate a few of the more important species of the timber of Morton Bay with Notonda illustrative of the qualities, localities, and uses for which I am indebted in great measure to Mr. Andrew Petri, the able and intelligent superintendent of government works at Morton Bay, while that part of the territory was a penal settlement. Dr. Lang speaks first of the Araucaria Cunninghami, or the Morton Bay Pine. He ends his description by saying, There are two varieties of this pine that of the mountain and that of the plains or alluvial flats on the banks of rivers. Of the former of these varieties, Mr. Petrie, who first observed its superior qualities, states that it is little inferior to the bunya bunya pine. It is well adapted for masts and spars and grows nearly as large as the bunya, no sap or knots to injure the spars. Secondly, Mr. Lang speaks of the Araucaria bidwelli, or the Bunya Bunya pine, and he again quotes from his friend. He writes, This tree, observes Mr. Petri, grows to an immense height and girth. I have measured some ordinary sized trees, 150 feet high and about 4 feet in diameter. They are as straight and round as a gun barrel. The timber grows in a spiral form, and would answer admirably for ship's masts of any size. That pine bears a great strain traversely, one of its superior qualities. Also, there is no sapwood or knots in the barrel, the lateral branches being never above two or three inches in diameter and growing from the outer rind of the tree. The fruit of this pine is a large cone or core, about nine by six inches and covered with small cones, similar in appearance to a pineapple. It is these small nuts that the blacks eat. They travel two or three hundred miles to feed on the fruit. It is plentiful every three years. The timber grows in latitude 25 and 26 degrees and about 60 miles in longitude. It is not known at present to grow anywhere else. It grows plentifully in this latitude. 
I was the first person who risked my life with others in procuring the first plants of this tree, and Mr. Bidwell was some years after me. Dr. Lang next writes of the red cedar, and tells how in the prisoner's time the government had it all cut down to give employment to the convicts, and large quantities went to waste. He then quotes yet again from Mr. Petrie. Ironbark. This tree grows plentifully in the forest, and is suitable for house or shipbuilding, and is a valuable timber. Blue gum. This is another valuable hardwood timber, and is well adapted for all kinds of carpentry work. Box. This timber is very suitable for all agricultural implements, and for many other purposes. Rose or violet wood. This is a valuable timber, and is suitable for gig shafts, etc., being similar to our lance wood at home. The Aborigines make their spears of this wood, and they know the art of straightening them when crooked. Silk oak. This is a very beautiful tree, and the timber is well adapted for the sheathing of vessels and many other useful purposes. Forest oak. Known also by the name of beef wood, suitable for tool handles, bullock yokes, etc. It is used principally for firewood. Tulip wood. This wood is suitable for fancy, cabinet, and turning work. It grows in the scrub. The tree appears like a cluster of Gothic columns. There are a great many other species of valuable timber in this district, observes Mr. Petrie, that I have not described, not having specimens to give you. Logwood and fustic have been procured here. The timber trade will form one of the principal branches of commerce. I also send you a small sample of the native gums. Gums could be procured in this district in considerable quantities. It is interesting to compare the first opinions formed of the timbers of Morton Bay with those of the present day. Mr. Petrie was correct in his prophecy that the timber trade will form one of the principal branches of commerce. We will now follow him in his adventures whilst obtaining specimens of the Bunya Bunya pine. The exact date of his discovery of the tree is not remembered, but several years after he gave a Mr. Bidwell specimens, and that gentleman forwarding them to England got the credit of the discovery, for the tree was named after him, Araucaria Bidwelli. During an excursion to Marucci in those early years, Mr. Petrie succeeded in procuring what has been spoken of as the first specimens of bunya pine seen by those in the settlement. From the plants he brought with him, says Mr. Knight, which were obtained at considerable risk owing to the unfriendly attitude of the blacks, may be said to have sprung many of the fine specimens now to be seen about Brisbane and Sydney. On this excursion he was accompanied by his son John, so well known afterwards in Brisbane, two convicts and two native blacks as guides, Tunbur and Dandawayan. They also had with them a pack bullock which carried the rations and blankets. Mr. Petri got specimens of different kinds of timber besides the bunya, and years afterwards when his son Tom travelled with the blacks to their feast of the bunya season, they showed the young fellow where his father had been, between Dulong and Razorback, and the direction he took through the scrub. On the return from this trip, Mr. Petri camped at the foot of the Birwa mountain, for he was anxious to ascend it and take observations from the summit. He always carried his instruments with him. He tried to get a black fellow to climb also, but in vain, for the man declared that should such a thing be done, the spirit who lived at the top of the mountain would kill him. John Petrie, therefore, accompanied his father, and they carried with them a bottle of water, reaching the top after great difficulty. Mr. Petrie took bearings for the assistance of the surveyors, who were then commencing a trigonometrical survey and after a good look round and a rest, he wrote his name, with date attached on a slip of paper, and corking this up in the now empty bottle, placed it safely under a rock, and descended to the camp. In after years, John Petrie called his house on Gregory Terrace, Birwa. The next person who climbed Birwa was Mr. Burnett, the government surveyor, after whom the Burnett River was named, and he also put his name in the bottle. Several others have been up since. 
The story of the bottle was told my father by grandfather years after the event, when the old gentleman was blind. The blacks had a strange idea about that same blindness. They declared that the spirit of the mountain had caused it, in order that Mr. Petrie would be forever afterwards unable to see his way up again. I have already quoted from a book written by Mr. T. Archer, Recollections of a Rambling Life, and now add the following extract, which is of interest here. Before finally squatting in this unpromising land, we made some efforts to discover something better by making excursions into the surrounding country. I set off on foot one day on one of these search expeditions, accompanied by Jimmy and a native of the country named Jimmy Birwa, who could speak a little dog English or blackfellow slang, having been occasionally at the German mission near Brisbane. He led us ten or a dozen miles eastward through thickly timbered and very poor country, when there appeared ahead of us a huge isolated sugarloaf mountain, presenting an apparently inaccessible wall of bare rock. When we reached the foot of it, I sat down on a stone, thinking our adventures for that day were over, but Jimmy Birwa continued to advance, making use of some crevices and projections to haul himself upwards, and beckoning to us to follow. Not to disgrace my Norwegian training as a cragsman, I did so, and the other Jimmy brought up the rear, and never have I forgotten the magnificent view that met our gaze when, after half an hour's scramble, we reached the top. Nearly the whole of the Morton Bay district lay spread out beneath us, and about a dozen miles to the eastward of us was the sea, the sea, the open sea, glittering in the sunlight, with Bribys Island, Morton Island and Morton Bay to the south, and a hundred miles of coast, stretching away to the north. For two years I had not beheld this, my favorite element, and was delighted to see it once more. But Jimmy, who had never before seen a sheet of water bigger than Wingate's lagoon, was transfixed with astonishment, and stood staring at it in mute admiration, though he was far too proud to give vent to his feelings by indulging in undignified gestures like his more unsophisticated and barbarous countrymen on their first introduction to a flock of sheep. I had begun the ascent of that mountain, laying the flattering unction to my soul that I was the first white man to accomplish the feat. But when about halfway up I began to notice indications of whites having been before me, in sundry scratches on the rocks that could have been made only by the nailed soles of boots, and what was my disgust, on attaining the pinnacle, to discover a cairn of stones containing a bottle in which was a scrap of paper with the names of Andrew Petrie and John Petrie, his son, and one or two others written on it in pencil. This was a mortifying discovery, but one that had to be borne with becoming resignation. The name of the mountain was Birwa, and it was the highest and most westerly of a cluster of peaked hills, scattered irregularly between it and the sea, called the Glass House Mountains. Our guide, Jimmy Birwa, had probably that name bestowed on him by Mr. Petrie, the government engineer at Brisbane, for guiding him and his party to the top of the mountain shortly before our arrival. Jimmy Birwa, no doubt, tried to explain this to us, but our ignorance of the Morton Bay black slang prevented us from understanding him. The writer came across Mr. Archer's book after describing Mount Birwa's ascent by Mr. Andrew Petrie. It will be seen that the latter climbed with his son, without the assistance of a black fellow, but perchance Jimmy Birwa was the black who refused to climb on that occasion. This Jimmy Birwa was, my father says, a regular messenger man among the blacks. He carried messages from tribe to tribe by means of the usual notched stick. A messenger could travel anywhere with safety, going unharmed even amongst hostile tribes. Another time my grandfather journeyed from Brisbane to where Kabulchur is now to obtain a block of timber from a bunya pine. This time he had with him the same black fellows, two or three convicts, and his son John. The first night they camped at North Pine, where the Kippa Ring was then, and of course roundabout was all wild forest, no roads to Kabulchur, nor bush tracks even. 
Long afterwards, when my father went to live at the Pine, the Aborigines showed him just where his father had camped. They said he had with him a bullock on which chains were put, all same as croppies, prisoners, so that fellow not ran away. The Kippa Ring at the Pine owned the curious native name of Nindur Nginendo, which means a leech sitting down. The larger ring was made just where the present road is, opposite the blacksmith's shop, and the roadway to the smaller one where the travellers camped ran up behind the shop to the top of the ridge, where, in the paddock behind Moromba, even yet a part of the ring and roadway can be seen. When Mr. Petrie and his companions had reached the Kvulcher River, they had to go up it a little way in order to be able to cross with the packed bullock. The pine they were in quest of stood on the north bank. Arriving at the tree, they started to cut out a piece, and the blacks showed they did not like this at all, complaining that they had piloted the party to see the tree, not to cut it. I have previously mentioned that the Aborigines would not, in the very early days, even cut notches in a bunya pine, and on this occasion they almost cried in their distress, saying the tree would die of its wounds. Mr. Andrew Petrie had to assure them that it would not, and he promised supplies of tobacco. So the deed was done, and after camping that night, the junk of wood was put on the pack bullock next morning, and eventually Brisbane was safely reached. Mr. Petrie had the block of timber cut up, and some of it polished to show the grain. Doubtless there are farmers still on the Kabulchur River who remember seeing that old bunya tree with a piece cut from it. It stood close to where the bridge now crosses the river. Mr. Henry Stuart Russell, author of Genesis of Queensland, refers to the banya tree. He says, The banya banya, Araucaria bidwelli, which expresses so much in Aboriginal traditions, claims a few remarks before passing on to Wide Bay. Andrew Petrie, who held the post of foreman of works January 1836 under the government Brisbane, was the first white intelligent discoverer of this tree, sometimes, I think, in 1838. Under the guidance of some blacks, he had visited a spot on which it grew, took a drawing of it and brought in a sample of the timber, the finding of which, and his opinion as to its value, he at once reported. It got the name of Pinus Petriana, deservedly, I should have thought, but not, it seemed, in accordance with the manorial rites of red tape. Mr. Russell then speaks of meeting, shortly after returning from Wide Bay in 1842, a Mr. Bidwell, an attaché to the Botanical Society in London, in search of bunya plants to send to England. He sent three, two of which Mr. Russell afterwards saw growing there. The latter adds, Being reported in this fashion it became known de rigueur as the Araucaria Bidwelli for all time. The true workers... Petris, solid claim, was outbid by the less title to fame. I can recollect cones of the bunya being sold at Covent Garden, London, for ten guineas each. Yet another extract from Mr. Archer's book. They, the blacks, were quiet and peaceable, and not nearly as numerous as at Darandur, except in the bunya season, when they mustered in large numbers from great distances, but then the bunya cones supplied them so amply with food that they were not tempted by hunger to supply themselves with animal food from our flocks. I need not describe to you the bunya tree, as you have all seen one growing in the Graysmere garden where it thrives, though it is not a native of that district. The tree, when in its native home, is confined to a comparatively small space of country, beginning about Cunningham's Gap in the south, and extending northward along the main range for about 150 miles to the head of the Kuyar Creek, where a spur branches off from the main range eastwards toward the coast, separating the waters of the Brisbane from those of the Mary River, and approaching the coast between the Glasshouse Mountains and the Maruchi River, its length being about another 150 miles. Along this range and all its skirts, the Bunya flourishes, and supplies, or supplied, the blacks every third year with ample stores of food from its huge cones, larger than a man's head, 
and containing kernels as large as an almond. Its botanical name, the Araucaria Bidwelli, was given to it because Mr. Bidwell is supposed to be the first white man who brought it into notice. But this is a mistake. The tree was first discovered by Mr. Petrie, the government engineer, on his expedition mentioned above, when he ascended Mount Birwa and found the Maruchi River. He, however, was not a scientific botanist, and only reported his discoveries in the colonies, whereas Mr. Bidwell sent the cone to England, and thus got the credit of being the discoverer of the tree. In Mr. Andrew Petrie's diary of his trip to Wide Bay in 1842, to be quoted later, speaking of that part of the world, he says, In this scrub I found a species of pine not known before. It is similar to the New Zealand cowrie pine and bears a cone. It forms a valuable timber, etc. This evidently is the pine Agatis robusta, known to the early blacks as Dundardum, Dundardum. The white man has mispronounced it so, Dundathu. An article on Brisbane by an unsigned writer appearing in the town and country journal some time since speaks of Mr. Andrew Petrie's discoveries, then adds, He was, in fact, so indefatigable in developing the natural resources of the district and laboring for his welfare that any attempt to write the story of Brisbane would be absolutely incomplete without reference to the pioneer Andrew Petrie and his descendants. With regard to his coal discoveries, Mr. J. J. Knight says, In several other ways did Mr. Petrie demonstrate the capabilities of the district, not the least important being the discovery of coal at Tivoli while on a visit to Red Bank Station. So impressed was he with the importance of this find that he sent two sample casks to Sydney. It was tested and pronounced highly satisfactory. At a later period, it may be mentioned, a tunnel was run into the hill and a plentiful supply obtained for the penal establishment. It may also be remarked that Mr. Petrie found, though some time after the discovery at Tivoli, the Black Diamond at Red Bank and McGill, and mines at these places were in subsequent years worked by the veteran John Williams. The value of such discoveries was not wholly apparent in those bygone days. It is now that the trade has grown to such dimensions and forms so important a part of the commercial worth that we can realize their importance to the full. End of Part 2, Chapter 5「Section 30 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. Part 2, Chapter 6. In 1842, Mr. Andrew Petrie discovered the Mary River. On this trip he was accompanied by Mr. Henry Stuart Russell, the Honorary W. Rottesley, third son of Lord Rottesley, and Mr. Jolliffe. Five prisoners of the Crown formed the boat's crew, and two Aborigines belonging to Brisbane made up the party. They left in an old government boat called the Gig, and were away about the month. The trip was a most eventful one, and I cannot do better than give an extract from an old diary which my grandfather kept in those days, and which reads as follows. Wednesday, 4th of May, 1842. Left Brisbane town at daybreak, pulled down to the first flat, Breakfast Creek, set sail, wind from the southwest, made the north end of Bribey's Island Passage at dusk, could not distinguish the passage, lay at anchor and slept in the boat till daybreak. Fifth, made sail for the river Marucci Doro, or the Black Swan River, Arrived there at two o'clock, but was afraid to enter, it being low water at the time and a heavy surf on the bar. Made way for Madumba Island, distant about two miles from the river, but could not effect a landing on account of the surf. Set sail for Braceville Cape, and arrived shortly after sunset in the bay or bight. There was a very heavy swell, which made it difficult landing. 
Before leaving the boat we were surprised to see twenty or thirty aborigines running along the beach, coming to meet us. I made signs to them to carry us ashore, and they immediately jumped into the water up to their armpits. I was the first who mounted their shoulders. They appeared bold and daring, and I immediately suspected that this must be the place where several shipwrecked seamen had been murdered by these black cannibals. Little did I think at the time that the one who carried me ashore was the principal murderer. The moment he put me off his shoulders he laid hold of my blanket, but I seized him and made him drop it. He then took hold of a bag of biscuit and would have taken it away had I not taken strong measures to prevent him. There were no guns on shore, and those on board were not loaded, so I called for my rifle, and loading it, kept them at bay, and at the same time made them carry our luggage on shore. We then gave them a few biscuits and ordered them off to their camp, retaining the murderer and another, and kept regular watch all night, each of us taking an hour in turn. During supper I made inquiries about Wandi, the bush name of the runaway Bracefield, and was informed by the natives that he was only a short way off. Sixth, Early this morning I dispatched our two blacks and one of the strange ones with a letter to Bracefield. He could not read, but one of the blacks mentioned my name to him when he gave him the letter, and he started instantly to join us, accompanied by three of his tribe, his adopted father and two of his friends. About eleven o'clock the black observed them coming about five miles off, and Mr. Jolliffe and I, also Joseph Russell, one of our crew, and the black fellow went along the beach to meet them. Bracefield, when we met him, had the same appearance as the wild blacks. I could only recognize him as a European from having known him before. When I spoke to him, he could not answer me for some time. His heart was full and tears flowed, and the language did not come readily to him. His first expression was to thank me for being the means of bringing him back to the society of white men again. He was anxious to hear about the settlement, and to know whether anything would be done to him. I assured him that no punishment would be inflicted on him, but rather things would turn to his advantage. On coming along to our camp, Bracefield said to me, I suppose, sir, you are not aware that the black you have got with you is the murderer of several white men. The moment the man observed us talking about him, he darted off into the bush in an instant, just as I was looking round at him. The men at the camp were very kind to Bracefield, got him washed, gave him clothing and something to eat and drink, and he felt himself a different being. After dinner I took him up some adjoining hills which I named after him and his friend, the black fellow, who gave me the names of the different mountains. This bay or inlet has a river in the bight, which forms several large lakes or sheets of water. A few miles inland from one of these lakes, Mrs. Fraser, wife of Captain Fraser of the Stirling Castle, was rescued from the blacks by Bracefield and conveyed to the boats which were anchored at the same place where we encamped. 7th. Set sail about 8 a.m., wind southeast for Wide Bay, taking Bracefield with us, landed about 4 o'clock, distance 30 miles, found it difficult to land owing to the heavy swell in the bight. After landing I found an excellent boat harbor. We stayed there for the night. 8th. Sunday. Went up to the Cape and Russell Hill to take some bearings, but the morning being so hazy nothing was satisfactory. After returning about eleven o'clock, we set sail over the bay with a southeast wind. About three p.m. were in the passage leading into what is called Wide Bay. Landed for the purpose of getting a black fellow that knew the river. Bracefield dispatched a black after him across Rottesley Bay. He arrived about an hour before sundown. We sailed down the passage about six miles, and camped on Fraser's Island. Ninth, Started at sunrise, taking the direction from the strange blackfellow. A dense fog continued until eleven o'clock. We steered northwest, and the wind springing up from the northeast, we continued sailing and pulling about among the islands, looking out for the river, but without success. Tenth, 
started early, circumnavigated Gammon Island and landed nearly where we started from. Observing a black fire on Fraser's Island, I proposed making for that point, intending to take bearings from the highland, from which I also thought I might see the river. While engaged in taking bearings, I described the river accordingly. It is called the Wide Bay River. While I was on the hill, the rest of the party procured some fresh water and tried all they could to persuade one of the natives to accompany us across to the river, but were not successful. They appeared afraid of us, more especially of Mr. Rottersley's red shirt. We left the island about 3 p.m., reached the mouth of the river Barney at sundown, and encamped on Jolliffe's head. This point of land is of marine formation, being calciferous ironstone strata, is peculiarly laid up and intermixed, lies at about an angle of 70 degrees, forming a ridge of land covered with scrub along the north side. In this scrub I found a species of pine, not known before. It is similar to the New Zealand cowrie pine, and bears a cone. It forms a valuable timber. The blacks make their nets of the inner bark of this tree. 11th. Ascended the river about 20 miles, next day about 25 miles higher, and the following day about 4 miles, about 50 in all, where we found the navigation stopped with rocks and shingly beds. After we landed I dispatched Bracefield and our black Ulapa, or Alopa, to see if they could find any natives, but they did not succeed blacks were afraid. I went in among the scrubs and procured some specimens of timber. Ulapa speared a fine freshwater mullet with flat mouth and red eyes, about two and a half pounds weight. Shortly after I took a stroll, but without my gun and quite alone, not expecting to meet with any blacks. I had not gone above half a mile from the camp when I heard the sound of natives, who appeared to be numerous. I immediately returned to the camp and sent off Bracefield and the black to them. They were absent about an hour and a half, and reported on their return that they were afraid to go near the black's camp, the darkies were so numerous. Bracefield was sure there were some hundreds of them, and he and the black were both very much frightened. He told me he would require two more men with firearms. Bracefield informed me the men we were in quest of Davis, or Durham boy, his bush name, was sure to be with the tribe, on which I offered to accompany him and assist him in procuring him. Bracefield said it would be much better for me to remain at the camp, as I should otherwise be running a great risk, and proposed that two of our party, Clark and Russell, both prisoners of the Crown, convicts, should go along with him, as if they succeeded in bringing him into our camp, something might be done for these men in the way of mitigating their punishment. I assented, arranging with them to go to their assistance if we should hear their guns fire, and they went off accordingly about half past four p.m., and about sundown returned with Davis. Bracefield behaved manfully in this transaction. He directed Russell and Clark to remain at a distance while he and the black fellow should steal in upon the strange blacks. Soon after the two got in among them, the two white men were observed, and the strange blacks immediately snatching up their spears were running off to murder them, when Davies and Bracefield prevented them, and no doubt saved the lives of the pair. By this time Bracefield had been recognized by a great number of the White Bay blacks who knew him, and told him, as the reason of their murderous intentions towards the two white men, that the white fellows had poisoned the number of their tribe. But Bracefield explained to them that we knew nothing of it whatever, and that we were come to explore the river and the country, and would not interfere with the blacks, provided that they did not meddle with the white men. If they did, there were a great many white men in firearms, and they would be shot immediately. I had written a note to Davies informing him that nothing would be done to him if he came into the settlement. He had, however, during this time darted off to Russell and Clark, and gave himself up to them without waiting for Bracefield and the black, and when they appeared, he told Bracefield that he, Bracefield, had come to take him for the purpose of getting his own sentence mitigated, 
in fact, insisted that he had, refusing to believe Bracefield's assertions to the contrary, until the latter got into a passion and sang a war song at him. With that, Davies bolted off towards us, our men being scarcely able to keep pace with him. I shall never forget his appearance when he arrived at our camp, a white man in a state of nudity, and actually a wild man of the woods, his eyes wild and unable to rest for a moment on any one object. He had quite the same manners and gestures that the wildest blacks have got. He could not speak his mither's tongue, as he called it. He could not even pronounce English for some time, and when he did attempt it, all he could say was a few words, and these often misapplied, breaking off abruptly in the middle of a sentence with black gibberish, which he spoke very fluently. During the whole of our conversation, his eyes and manner were completely wild, and he looked at us as if he had never seen a white man before. In fact, he told us that he had nearly forgotten all about the society of white men, and had hardly thought about his friends and relations for these fourteen years past, and had I or someone else not brought him from among these savages, he never would have left them. One of the first questions he asked me was about the settlement at Morton Bay, which I gave him to understand was now a free settlement, and a very different place altogether from what it was when he left it fourteen years ago. I only guessed at the period from some of the prisoners mentioning about the time he absconded, as he had no idea of it himself, and could not tell what time he had been in the bush. At the same time I assured him that no punishment would be inflicted on him for absconding. I then told Davis it was my intention to proceed to Bapal, Popol, an adjoining mountain, but he strongly advised me not to attempt this. For if we divided our party, the men that we left at the boat would all be murdered before we returned, as there were some hundreds of blacks at their camp who could surround the party and kill them all. He told me we would require three or four men to keep watch during the night, for in all probability they would then attack us. At the same time he asked if I would allow him to go back and remain with the blacks for the night, and he would try and make it all right with them. He pledged his word he would return to us by daybreak. I told him by all means go, and we would wait for him. He said the blacks were determined to attack us, as they would have revenge for the poisoning of their friends at some of the stations to the south. Davies then bade us good night and left us. The greater number of our party, mostly all except myself, never thought he would come back, or if he did, they thought it would be heading the blacks against us. This made our party very timid, and I therefore took what I thought the most prudent plan, which was to put everything in the boat and sleep on board, keeping a regular watch all night. The men and ourselves would have been so much fatigued, and knowing some of our party would not prove firm and were not accustomed to firearms, we concluded it must be the best plan to camp in the boat. We were then in a position to defend ourselves, although hundreds had attacked us. We kept watch all night. Some of us did not sleep much. We were all prepared for them. At daybreak I ordered three musket shots to be fired at intervals, to let Davies know that we were still in the same place, waiting his coming. About sunrise he joined us, accompanied by a black, who had possession of a watch belonging to a man, a shepherd of Mr. Now Sir Evan Mackenzie, who was murdered by the blacks at Kilcoy Station some time before. I gave the black fellow a tomahawk for the watch, according to promise. He appeared very much afraid of us. Bracefield and the black Ulapa had accompanied Davies to the native encampment, and when they reached it, seeing our black so plump and fat, the White Bay natives asked Bracefield and Davies if the white men would take the part of the black and attack them if they were to kill and eat him. They both gave them to understand in reply that there were a great many white men in arms at the boat, and that in that case they would come and shoot them all. All this time Davies was at a loss to know how the white men had got there. He imagined they came over land. The moment our men appeared before their camp, they immediately said, these were the men that killed their people to the southward, and instantly manned their spears and wadis, and would have sallied forth on the white men had Davies not prevented them. 
By this time Bracefield had stripped himself of the clothes we had given him, and he went in among them and was immediately recognized by a great many, who invited him to sup with them and remain for the night. Davies and he made them believe that they would both return to them, and before leaving the camp Davies made them an oration, informing them that it was not to molest them, but to explore the river and the country, and to search for him, Davies, that the white men had come, and that they knew nothing of the poisoning of their friends. They intended no harm if they, the blacks, would not molest them, but if they did, they would all be shot by the whites. He also made them understand that their spears were nothing compared to our guns, and made them believe that the guns were something terrible. This had the desired effect, for in the morning at the first report of the musket we fired, not a murmur was heard, the mothers making their young ones lie quiet lest we should hear them. At the second report the greater part of them took to the scrub, and on hearing the third report they nearly all fled in the greatest consternation. Thus terminated our maneuvers with the natives. Fourteenth. Descended the river about twenty miles. During our encampment we were all very much entertained with Davis's description of the manner of life and customs of the blacks. Also he gave the account of the manner the blacks murdered the two white men, Mr. Mackenzie's shepherds. They took a very ingenious mode, and one of the men must have suffered an awful death according to the description. Davis also described the way the blacks hunted the kangaroo and emu, which was very amusing. They make a play or game of this sport among themselves. Happening in the course of the evening to ask him if he could climb the trees with a wild vine, he started up instantly, threw off his clothes and procuring a vine, was at the top of one of the trees with it in a few minutes. His clothes were a great annoyance to him for some days. 16th. Arrived at our former camp on Fraser's Island about 5 p.m. Conversed with a native of the island who knew Davis and Bracefield. We showed him how far our guns carried, which appeared to astonish him. There were six canoes with about twenty blacks fishing out on a flat about three miles from us. Jolliffe fired off a musket. They saw the ball hopping over the water toward them. I believe it frightened them very much. After consulting a little, they all took to their canoes and made off from us. At this time Davis was conversing with the blacks on shore. 17th. On continuing our journey we were met by a great many natives who were fishing at the mouth of the passage. I got Davis and Bracefield to inquire of them where the white men's bones were buried, those of Captain Fraser and Brown of the Stirling Castle. They pointed round the point about two miles. Mr. Rottesley and I landed and went along the beach. While traveling along with them we ascertained the bones were those of black men. When we arrived at their camp we saw three miserable old gins. A black fellow went into his humpy and brought out a dilly full of bones. We let him understand that it was the white fellow's bones we wanted. He told Davis they were a long way off on the main beach, about ten miles. We would have gone this far, but our time was up, and we had to return. Rottesley bought a dilly from the natives for a fish hook. Then we left them, and proceeded across the bay to Cape Brown, landed about five o'clock, got into that commodious boat harbour, and remained there for the night. The blacks are very numerous on Fraser Island. There is a nut they find on it which they eat, and the fish are very plentiful. The formation and production of the islands are much the same as those on Morton Island. The timber is a great deal superior, and also the soil, the cypress pine upon Fraser Island being quite splendid. The island is sixty miles long, by ten or twelve wide. Eighteenth. It blew very fresh from the southwest, lulled towards evening. About four o'clock p.m., ordered everything into the boat, and in a short time were out at sea. After rounding Cape Brown, there was a very heavy swell setting in from the southward, and it kept on increasing so much that we could not bear up to windward. Jolliffe lost one of the guns overboard. Going nearly four points off our course, we continued on till about nine o'clock, when I ordered a bad ship. 
We were only about eight miles from Cape Brown. It was no use hammering about all night, and the breeze still increasing, we landed at our old camp about eleven o'clock. Next day set sail about eleven o'clock with a southwest wind. About three miles off Cape Brown, the wind got more southerly. Continued about the same course and distance we did the night before. I thought it would be better to return, and it was fortunate we did as the wind still increasing and a very heavy sea on, we never could have reached Bracefield Head. We landed again in a honeysuckle camp about three o'clock p.m., ordered everything out of the boat to be cleaned and overhauled, hauled the boat up on the beach. The bilge water was smelling very badly. Mr. Russell and some of the boat's crew got quite sick, so much so that the former threw up his breakfast and some of his chat went with it. Only a few ejaculations escaped his lips, a repetition of a beastly boat, a beastly sail, etc., during all the night and following days. The wide Bay River is navigable for a vessel drawing nine feet of water for about forty miles up. The country on its banks is a good sheep country, and the farther you proceed to the westward, the better the land. The blacks informed me there is a river about ten miles beyond the Wide Bay River, and another more to the northwestward, and a third larger than all the others, still farther to the westward, and pointed a long way into the interior to where the water came from. This last river we thought must be the Boyne. They also informed us that there was a beautiful country about forty miles from the Bapal mountain, extending quite to the ocean and abounding in emus and kangaroos. According to their account, this country is thinly wooded. End of Part 2, Chapter 6「Section 31 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, Part 2, Chapter 7 This whale boat trip to Wide Bay and Mr. Andrew Petrie's discovery of the river there was recently referred to by Sir Hugh Nelson at a conference of the Royal Geographical Society held in Mirraborough. The river discovered was known as the Wide Bay River for some years, but afterwards was christened the Mary in honour of Lady Fitzroy. Nowadays, following Mr. Andrew Petrie's diary, one fails to recognise all points of interest by the names given. With regard to this, Mr. Knight, in his description of the trip, says, quote, On the following day, the party reached a place named by Mr. Petrie, Bracefield Cape, but during later years renamed Noosa. And it may here be remarked that it was little short of criminal to substitute the present names for those bestowed by this band of explorers. End quote. It was near Noosa that Bracefield, or Graham Wandy, the blacks called him, was found, hence the name Bracefield Cape. He was a convict who had deserted in Logan's time, and it was he who rescued Mrs. Fraser, wife of Captain Fraser of the Stirling Castle, from the Aboriginals. The wreck of the Stirling Castle, the boat, by the way, in which the Petries travelled from the old country some time previously, is ancient history now, and it will be remembered that Mrs. Fraser was obliged to live alone with the blacks until the time when Bracefield took her down to within a few miles of the settlement and so was the means of her release. Mr. Henry Stuart Russell, one of this band of explorers, refers to the naming of the different places. In one part he says, quote, Of the coast of the mainland between Cape Morton and Sandy Cape, little had hitherto been known. No survey of it had 
under any close examination from seawards been made, none whatever from landwards. Petrie, being in the service of the government and acting under Sir George Gipps's instructions, considered himself authorised to name mountains, headlands or any remarkable spot not yet distinguished on a chart as he saw fit, with a view of sending in his report, under which such designations would be printed out on government maps. The low bluff which formed the southern and most eastern point of the sandy bay in which we were, he called Bracefield's Head, being most suggestive of the occurrence which had so much preoccupied us of late. From a higher ground further back we could see several noteworthy eminences which we had remarked from the boat when following the coastline. Of these, Bracefield told the native names which were written down on the spot." End quote. It seems a matter for regret that any of these names should have been tampered with, or that a true discoverer should in any way be overlooked. In those early times, however, many mistakes were made in different ways. Of course, it could hardly be otherwise. With regard to Brisbane Town, it may not be a mis- to mention an instance here. Governor Gibbs, when the town was about to be laid out, was not pleased with the surveyor's plans. The roads were too wide, and too much land had been wasted in reserves for his taste. Consequently, quote, the whole design had to be altered, says Mr Knight, end quote. This, it appears, was a common trick of Governor Gibbs's still quoting Mr Knight, for in every other case where he had anything to do with the laying out of a place, he acted in exactly the same manner. His argument in favour of narrow streets was novel, if unsound, namely that the buildings on either side of such thoroughfares would have the effect of keeping out the sun. Mr Andrew Petrie, actually came to loggerheads with the Governor over the foolish proposition, and to mark his condemnation of the opinion of others, His Excellency ordered the width of all streets in Ipswich, as well as in Brisbane, to be reduced to 66 feet. Eventually the surveyors, after a good deal of trouble, were allowed to make the principal thoroughfares about 80 feet. Looking at Governor Gibbs's grabbing propensities, it is a matter for wonder that the Queen's Park escaped being cut up into town lots. End quote. But to hail back to Wide Bay and the trip undertaken in what Mr. Russell terms a nondescript boat, quote, certainly he says, when in the water with her full burden, a midship's rollick was but a measured five inches above the water, for I tried the distance afterwards. But I found that we could step two lug sails and carry a bumpkin stuck out for a bit of after canvas. That was a comfort. End quote. Mr Jolliffe, being a sailor, was bound, Mr Russell says, to laugh at the boat. How these gentlemen came to join Mr Petrie on this trip happened in this wise. Mr. Russell was on the lookout for a fresh run for sheep, and so also was Mr. Jolliffe. Mr. Russell had just determined to purchase a small craft or yawl and start out, and was thinking over his plans when Mr. Jolliffe, bursting in upon him, informed him that Mr. Petrie had heard of his intention. Quote, I've had a long yarn with Petrie about your going, and I will tell you what he says. You've heard of that Bunya Bunya which the blacks here talk so much about. Petrie is the only white man who has looked for and found it. He has a bit of its wood, you know. It's called Petrie's Pine. And mighty proud of his discovery he is. Well, the Governor gave him orders before he left to go to the river on which they say it grows most and examine it thoroughly and report. A proclamation has been issued that no settlers are to encroach upon its quarters and no white man is to cut down any of it. 
Petrie says he must go at once. The place is on the banks of a river a little north of the river called the Maroochydore. Petrie says that queer looking oyster boat isn't fit for any sea. He wants you to join him and his work. Your own mind too perhaps may be knocked off by one trip. What boat can we have though? Why, there is a five-oared kind of mongrel whale boat which was built by a prisoner here in a fashion which he will take. You know that there will be no more commandants at Brisbane. He will take five ticket men to pull, a mast to stick up and a bit of sail when the wind serves. The boat is new and sound, whatever she looks like. That other thing's rotten. End quote. From Genesis of Queensland. And so this party set out, and in spite of many difficulties and hardships, surmounted all drawbacks, and in due course arrived safely back at the settlement again, with their interesting addition in the way of numbers. Mr. Russell is amusing in some of his details of this trip. On the party's start out, he begins to ask Mr. Petrie questions concerning the crew. When he finds that one man's name is Russell, like his own, he asks no more on that point. Later on, during the journey up, he loses his hat overboard, and on this account evidently gets a touch of the sun. But when the blacks carry the party ashore, his head is splitting and intolerable pains creep through his limbs. Writing of it, he says, quote, I suppose I was in some sort tortured by sunstroke. That night was a horrible seal upon my recollections thereof. One of the men was trying to make me a head covering out of some canvas, but why should my limbs torment me? Well, no explanation of the cause could have cured me, and thus I miserably stared the stars out of countenance with the help of the dawning day. My friends were alarmed, but could do nothing. Our two blacks were in such a funk that they kept me wakeful company throughout, though the whites watched in turn by pairs. With the sun's return came that of the natives. After much gesticulation to the party, an old man squatted on his hams on the hot sand and with a queer crone began to scoop out a hole with his hands alongside me. I took little heed until that had assumed under his vigorous and odiferous exertions almost the appearance of a shallow grave. As a man under his first flooring by seasickness so was I absolutely careless of what was going on around. Petrie and others, gravely looking on, rifle in hand, reassured me on one head, yet I could realise nothing. I believe I must have been fast becoming unconscious. What happened I can tell, however, now. When all was ready, I learnt that two younger natives had lifted me into the grave, divested of every rag on my back. Our own blacks had assured Petrie that the old man could put me on my legs again. He was too anxious about me to repel their proffered service, as long as there was no unreasonable means resorted to. Some large leaves of a water plant had been brought and placed over my head to protect it, and that again was raised upon a roll of my own clothes. Well, I remember the queer sensation of a hot sand being shoveled by their wooden implements, elements, over me, up to the very chin. After that I knew nothing till I came to the sense of where I was. In fact, I seemed to wake up from a painful dream. I could move but my head. The leaves were lifted from my face and the assemblage at first puzzled me. Arms had been packed in with the rest and I was in a straight jacket of hot sand pressed in a solid heap upon my carcass. But I felt no pain. 
The perspiration was still, for I was told that I'd been doing so for the last quarter of an hour, running in tiny rivulets from my head over my face into my eyes and ears. I was in a vapour furnace. Quickly I was unearthed, covered with blankets or anything that caught their eye, and fell fast asleep. When I woke in about six hours, I was well, weak, but terribly thirsty. I could have hugged the whole tribe in my gratitude, but they were all gone. I could see that the minds of my compagnon de voyage were much relieved, especially that kind-hearted Scot, Andrew Petrie. Some efficient headgear had been manufactured for me in the meanwhile, to commemorate which, the hummock at the point was named Russell's Cap. End quote. And so Mr. Russell goes on with the trip. He tells how they christened what is now Double Island Point, Brown's Cape, because Bracefield and the Blacks assured them that it was there that Brown, the mate of the Stirling Castle, had been killed and disposed of. Further on, he describes a mist into which they were entrapped, quote, so dense that, except the water immediately about the sides of the boat, nothing out of it could be distinguished, end quote. Getting free from this at last, they fell into other difficulties, christened an island Gammon Island, because after leaving it and pulling and sailing about, in and out and all over the place, they landed at exactly the same spot. Much to Mr. Russell's disgust, he suggested the name as suitable to, quote, his good Scotch friend Mr. Petrie, who totted it down with the ghost of a smile, unquote. In Mr. Petrie's diary, he describes a point of land as Jolliffe's Head, with regard to this, Mr. Russell says, quote, Jolliffe's long black beard had been an object of mirth, and I must add admiration, all the jaunt through, especially to the blacks. The new river head, which we were leaving and perhaps should never see again, tufted with that thick glossy patch of dark pine brush, some process associated itself with it. And down on the rough outline, the base of a future report, went under our official friend's hand, Jolliffe's Beard, for its baptismal name. I wonder whether it is called so still. Maybe it bears some later comers. End quote. End of section 31. Section 32 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, dating from 1837, recorded by his daughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The finding of the famous Durham boy and the story of his 14 years' adventures among the Aborigines has already been enlarged upon in many works. He said he was welcomed by the blacks as one of their number returned from the dead. When the white men were first seen by their dusky brethren, they were all supposed to be ghosts or former black men come to life again. All the different tribes had a name for ghost. For instance, with the Torbal or Brisbane blacks, it was Mogwi. With the Morton Island tribe, Targan, Noosa tribe Madar, and with the wide bay natives with whom Durambo lived, the word was Makiran. I have already written of the landing of Durambo and Wandi in Brisbane, and mentioned the excitement of the early time squatters over the event. These squatters came often to the old house on the Bight, Mr. Andrew Petrie's. That gentleman had a skillion put to his house, and here they slept and they were always very jolly and full of fun. Mr. John Campbell, writing of these early visits of the squatters to Brisbane, says, quote, There was no hotel in Brisbane then, but we were kindly and eagerly invited by the officers residing there to stop at their houses. 
in fact vying with each other who should receive us. For myself, I went to the late Mr. Andrew Petrie's, and a friendship then commenced between us, which only ended with his life." End quote. My father used often to swim across from Petrie's Bight to Kangaroo Point with some of these squatters and two or three blacks. They went for the purpose of fishing there with lines. If they had good luck, they would perhaps stay nearly all day. Often they caught lots of brim and flathead, and the natives would then carry these and dillies fixed to their heads back to the other side. One of the squatters was a Mr. Glover, and the blacks could not say his name, but called him Blubber. One day in swimming homewards, Tom got into a shoal of blubbers, and they stung him so frightfully that he could not swim. He called for assistance to the natives, and they only just came up in time, for he was sinking. Getting hold of the boy, they put him on the back of one fellow, and swam with him to the shore, thus saving his life. Landing, the native who had carried the burden turned and said to Mr. Glover, My word, Mr. Blubber, your brother, very saucy fellow. Some of these black fellows were very comical in their doings and sayings. There was another one of the name of Billy Bing, Bing meant father, and the squatters used to have great fun with him. He had a very large mouth and would burst out laughing at them and suddenly shut his mouth like a snuff box and pull a long face. The squatters would be nearly ill laughing at this man, especially one gentleman who would say, For God's sake, take him out of my sight. This was Mr. Henry Stuart Russell already referred to. Father remembers him well and says he was a great man to laugh. He evidently had a keen sense of humour and at times became quite powerless with laughter. He married a Miss Pinnock, niece of a governor of Jamaica and sister to Mr. P. Pinnock of Brisbane, the late sheriff. Strange that in after years Mr. Andrew Petrie's granddaughter, Tom's firstborn, should marry this same Mr. Russell's nephew, the present Major Pinnock. But to return. One day Mr. Russell said to Billy, Here Billy, come and have a glass of grog. And when he came, now Billy, hold the glass so and say, here's good health, gentlemen. The squatters all stood round, and Billy, who could not say health, took the glass, and this was his toast. Gentlemen, here you go hell. Of course, this caused roars of laughter, and indeed some of the squatters were so overcome that they rolled about on the grass. Always just the mere sight of Billy was enough to cause amusement. Mr. Andrew Petrie had a slaughterhouse put up in those days so that he could have a sheep or bullock killed for meat. A lot of meat was used when the squatters were about. One day my father remembers sitting in the killing house talking to the butcher and as he sat the youngster enjoyed a pipe he had got hold of when suddenly in the doorway appeared his father. Grandfather never smoked himself, and he strongly disapproved of the habit in his young son. Many a thrashing Tom got for this same habit, but alas, it did not cure him. On this occasion he was caught and beaten soundly. His screams brought the butcher's wife, who put in a good word for the boy, who thus made off. Still, however, holding firmly to his short pipe, so soon as ever he got into the bush, he struck a light with his tinderbox and had another smoke. In those days there were no matches and everyone carried flint and steel and tinderbox. Feeling himself ill-used after this beating, Tom made up his mind to run away and go to the blacks. So next day he started out to Bowen Hills to their camp there and falling in with some of his black boy playmates they all occupied themselves with making a new humpy. Before dark, he joined in a good meal of fish and crabs, and then when it was time to turn in, repaired with two or three black boys to the hut they had made. Tom had a suspicion that someone might come after him, 
so he kept his boots on in case of an emergency. He remembers he had a new hat and this he stuck up in the roof of the hut so that it wouldn't get broken. Then he got under a possum rug. He'd been there about an hour when suddenly he heard a great row, barking of dogs and a running about and shouting of the blacks. All at once he felt his leg grabbed and he was hauled out by his brother. He managed to get his hat and then just as his father came up, got away and ran off as fast as his legs would carry him all the way home. Going upstairs to his room, he stood there ready to climb out onto the roof should his father come up. However, he heard the arrival and the inquiry if he had come home and then someone said he had better be left alone. So the boy ventured to go to bed. He was up betimes in the morning and kept out of his father's way for a couple of days. My grandfather soon got over his anger though and always forgave his son. The squatters in those days nearly all had government ticket of leave men signed to them for a certain length of time. If they had a quarrel with a the man, there was no taking him to court, but off would go their coats and after a round or two, master and man would shake hands, good friends again. They were mostly well born, these squatters, and they were also gentlemen who enjoyed a piece of fun and mischief. Their bullock drays used to come down to Brisbane with wool, and these would be left on the south side because, of course, there was no bridge or any other way of getting across. Beside these drays, the squatters often left a cask of rum with the head knocked in and a pannikin alongside for anyone who cared to help himself to a drink. They would swim their horses across behind the ferry boats. The very first race course in Brisbane was started by the squatters on the ground now occupied by the present post office, etc. I have before mentioned the old women's factory. This building was empty when the Petries arrived in Brisbane, and there they lived till their own house on the Bight was built, and afterwards it was used as a jail and courthouse. Well, the course was from the corner of the old wall surrounding this building, just where the telegraph office now stands, down as far as Albert Street, and it was about here that a three-railed fence and a ditch some feet wide were jumped. Then the course continued round towards the gardens, the same ditch and fence being jumped again lower down, then up round by the Roman Catholic Cathedral and back to the corner of the wall. The ditch mentioned was cut as a drain to carry the water for the Lambeth Swampy into a small creek that ran into the river at the present Port Office Wharf. The place all round was fenced in in cultivation paddocks where the prisoners worked. My father remembers well one race run on this course. Four horses started. When the foremost reached the first fence, he tripped on the top rail. No hurdles then, of course, throwing his rider into the mud in the ditch. The young squatter got his nice leggings and all his fine jockeys rig out in a beautiful mess. He, however, picked himself up and, catching his horse, mounted and was off again, although the others had jumped all right and were some distance ahead. The next jump was taken successfully and the squatter overtook the three and passed them, winning eventually with a length to the good. There was great excitement and hurrahing at this. The horse's name was Hargaway, and he was a black animal with white feet. Quote, the horses in those days were horses, says my father, and could stand a three-mile race with ease. There were no weeds. Most of the squatters carried a regular jockey's dress with them, and they were splendid riders." End quote. When people commenced to settle a little and build, a man named Greenyard built a house up South Brisbane at Carilpa, pronounced in English Carilpa, what we now call West End. This man obtained a license for a public house, and the squatters then started a race course there. The next one was at Cooper's Plains, 
and the next at New Farm. Father remembers all sorts of pranks the young squatters used to play in those days. When they turned up at the old home on the bite, they slept on stretchers in the addition to the house, and when one of the number was found fast asleep by the others, he would be tied down and then quietly carried out into the bush 100 yards away, and there left to the mercy of the mosquitoes. A watch would be kept till he called for help, then he was taken in again. The victim was generally one who did not care to join in the fun. He would know, however, that it was no use getting into a scot, and he therefore took it all as a joke. Well, on this subject, I may mention an incident which happened later on, which changed the destiny of South Brisbane. A tree which grew near the spot mentioned was used as an anchorage for the steamers. That is, they were tied to the trunk. A Scotchman who owned the land one day for some reason or other objected to his tree being made use of any longer, and he cut the rope by which a Sydney steamer was tied. After that, another place had to be found, and the steamers went down the river to the north side of the stream, so spoiling the chance South Brisbane had of first place. This tree was very large in the trunk, but some of the branches were lopped to make room for the balcony of a stone hotel nearby. It was not often in those days that a steamer came to Morton Bay, as Brisbane was then called, so whenever one did come it caused quite a stir and excitement. The steamers always anchored at South Brisbane, just below the present bridge. On the arrival of one, the squatters would go over to her at night and have some fun. Mr. Russell would sometimes borrow a dress and bonnet from Tom's mother, and dressing up, he would then go off arm in arm with another squatter as man and wife across to the steamer. When there, they would hoist all sorts of things to the masthead in place of the flag, and the skipper would laugh too and enjoy the fun. Generally, the boat would be cleared of all grog before she left for Sydney again. On the 15th of May, 1847, the first vessel built in Morton Bay was launched. She saw the light at Petrie's Bight, where the Howard Smith Wharf is now, and was a two-masted vessel with both ends pointed, no square stern. The launching ceremony caused quite an excitement, and amongst those who witnessed it were the military and a party of ladies. To Miss Petrie, Andrew Petrie's only daughter, a tall, dark, handsome girl of some fourteen summers fell the honour of christening the vessel, and it is not surprising to know that her brother Tom, two years older, who was in everything, was one of those on board at the time. Miss Petrie stood on the shore with a bottle of champagne in her hand attached to the bow of the boat by a string, and as the vessel slid into the water she threw the bottle from her, christening the craft Selina. In the meantime, however, the sailors, thinking how lovely the drink of champagne would be afterwards on the quiet, had contrived a trick, and the bottle did not break, but this was noticed, and a crowd gathering round Miss Petrie got her to go out in a boat and finish her work. The Selina slid into the water with such an impetus that she would have gone right across to Kangaroo Point had the anchor not been dropped to stop her. After she was rigged and finished up, she started out for the Pine River, and having got a cargo there of cedar logs, left for Sydney, her builder, a Mr Cameron, being in charge. But the little vessel was doomed, in spite of the brightness of her birth, and the crew were never heard of again. For a long time the whole thing remained a mystery, then, on the 20th of October 1848, she was found on the beach at Keppel Bay, waterlogged and with her mast cut out. The cargo was quite undisturbed, and it was thought that, as the crew only had enough provisions to take them to Sydney, they had set out and perished at sea through starvation, or otherwise. Poor Mr Cameron, my father says, was a very nice man, and as far as I can remember, he had with him another shipwright and two sailors. 
The following is a yarn my father remembers the squatters telling one another. Whether it was founded on fact or not, he cannot say. A man was once driving a bullock team, either to or from Brisbane, laden heavily with wool or provisions. The roads, of course, were rough in those days, and coming to a creek, the bullocks would not pull hard enough to get over it. So the man began to swear at them, using all the swears he knew. While he was in the midst of this, a parson rode up and said he to the bullock driver, My good man, you should not use those words. It is very wrong, and bad words won't make the bullocks pull any better. The driver threw down his whip. You try and see if you can drive them, sir, he said. So the parson dismounted, and the bullock driver held his horse. Then began a series of pattings and coaxings, and the books, doubtless, were flattered at the pretty names they were called. They, however, swerved to this side and that, but they would not pull. The parson tried a long time, and only at last, when his patience must surely have given out, damn the bullocks, he said, and flinging aside the whip he had gently stroked them with, mounted and rode off. And afterwards, this particular bullock driver felt he had absolute freedom to swear as he liked. One night, the squatters got hold of a billy goat, and tying him to the bell rope of the Church of England in William Street, planted to see the fun. Billy commenced to ring the bell furiously. Then the police came along to see what was what, and nearly all the inhabitants of the place, there weren't so many, came running from all directions. As the goat moved about to try and get free, the bell would ring, and the police were very active in running round the building to try and catch the party who rang it. It was dark, and the squatters had used a good long rope, so the goat was some distance off. At last, however, a policeman tripped over the rope and fell. He got hold of it then, and holding on, poor Billy came to him. As may be imagined, he was disgusted when he saw how he had been taken in, and there were the squatters, bursting with laughter, but jeering with the crowd, just as though they knew no more than anyone else. The police asked if anyone could tell them who had tied the goat to the bell rope, but no one knew, of course. During the first election ever held in Brisbane, the squatters had a cask of ale rolled out onto the side of George Street opposite Gray's boot shop, and they had the head knocked in and a pint pot ready for the people to help themselves. There was a good crowd and a piper playing his pipes for amusement, and everyone was jolly, helping themselves to the beer. Suddenly a squatter, going behind the piper, stuck a penknife in his pipes. Of course, there was a sudden collapse, and a great to-do to know who had done the deed, the poor old piper threatening instant death. There was no more playing of the pipes that day. Later, when the people were all helping themselves to a pot of beer from the cask, a very little man named Shepherd, a tailor, not content with a pot full, brought along a bucket in order to carry it away full. As he was reaching in to fill this, Mr. Russell caught him by the legs and tilted him head first into the cask. When rescued, he was wringing wet with beer. In fact, he was nearly drowned, and he went away with the empty bucket amid great cheering. When people commenced to open little shops in Brisbane and put up signboards, the young squatters used to go at night and change these boards from one shop to another. This had a comical effect in the daytime, and caused many a laugh. Often things like that were done, but my father says he does not remember the squatters ever doing anything really wrong or unmanly. Indeed, he maintains at bottom they were very kind-hearted, and he wishes there were more of their stamp nowadays. People on the whole, he thinks, were kinder and more honest then than they are now. Everybody knew every soul in the small place, and a workman would leave his tools down alongside his work and come back to find them all right. 
Talking of squatters, there is a story told of one which may not be out of place here. Though the writer does not guarantee it had its origin in those very early times, but understands it related to later days. The story runs so. In his travels once, a squatter came at night to an inn which was full to overflowing and could not therefore obtain a bed. Finding he knew one of the gentlemen who had a room there and who had not yet turned up, he tipped the housemaid to lend him a lady's dress and shoes and other articles of wearing apparel. She wanted to know why he wished for these, but paying her handsomely for the loan, he soon satisfied her that it was all right. Taking them to his friend's room, he placed the articles about in prominent positions, then went to bed. His friend, coming in late, made for the room, and opening the door, heard a shrill, squeaking voice, which exclaimed in horror, Man in the room! Man in the room! Of course, the retreat was hurried and precipitous, and the lady's laughter was smothered as she thought with delight of the joy of a well-earned bed. Next morning, the landlord got a fierce dressing down from a gentleman who wished to know how he did put a lady in the room he had paid for. The landlord was profuse in his apologies, but declared he had done no such thing. Then afterwards, the story came out. I was extremely sorry to read of the death of Sir Arthur Hodgson, the father said, when the news was cabled to Brisbane. Quote, he was one of the good old sort. I knew him well. When he first came to Morton Bay, he came along to our home on the Bight with the other squatters. Many a time when a little chap, I had a ride on his horse on the race course. He used to give me his horse to hold for him, and I would then get on the animal and ride him about till wanted. Sir Arthur was a real good-hearted gentleman, one of the right sort, full of fun. One doesn't meet too many of his kind in these days." End quote. Another of these early time squatters, or men of the good old sort, was the late Sir Joshua Peter Bell, one of Queensland's best-known men. He arrived in 1846 and was a big, fine-looking man. He was a great friend of the blacks, his nature being such that they always placed the greatest confidence in him. His name and that of Jimbo are strongly linked, and I am indebted to his son, the Honourable J.T. Bell, our Minister for Lands, for the illustration of Warraba, taken at that station. This black, as a small boy, came to Jimbo with the first or second party of Europeans under the late Mr. Henry Dennis about 1843. He came from the Namoy in New South Wales and was an exceptionally fine specimen of an Aboriginal. In manner, dignity of bearing and intelligence, he resembled a superior type of white man. He died in 1891. Another well-known black on the northern end of the Darling Downs was Combo, who came over from the Big River in New South Wales some time before 1850 with the late Mr. O'Grady Halley of Tarbinger and the Burnet. The party travelled up from New South Wales via Logan and Nanango. Combo soon afterwards went to work on Jimbo and remained there until his death in 1903. His gin was a keen, shrewd woman, Mary Ann by name, and of their children too, became well-known athletes. The eldest, George, a short, thick black, was the crack runner on the Darling Downs, somewhere about 1875 or 1876, and defeated all the local white runners at Ipswich. The other son, Sambo, better known as Charlie Samuels, a long, lean boy, after vanquishing all comers at Dolby and on Darling Downs, was taken to Sydney by a Jim Boar stockman, and there swept the board. This was at a time when pedestrianism and professional running was at its height. Sambo, or Samuels, defeated the English champion, Harry Hutchins, twice, and thus earned the title of champion of the world. On the third occasion, Hutchins defeated Sambo, but the latter does not hesitate to say 
that he allowed the white man to win, saying, the poor fellow hadn't enough money. End of part two, chapter eight. Section 33 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine E. Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. Part 2, Chapter 9. Old Cocky. To write of the time of these early squatters, etc., and not mention the Petrie's cockatoo, would indeed be an insult to the memory of that wonderful bird, a bird who lived for forty-five years. During those years his fame spread far and wide. Indeed, Petrie's cocky was a household word everywhere. As he grew older it was quite a recognized thing that his life would be worth recording, and such was meant to be done. It never was, however, and therefore much with regard to cocky's clever ways has been lost. People there are alive yet, of course, who remember Cocky, and to them the tales I have to tell of him will seem no exaggeration. Others there will surely be, though, who, like Thomas of old, will doubt. To these I would say that there have been wonderful birds before in the world's history, and if they will consider it, this Cocky grew up in an exceptionally good school, living as he did in those early days and continually mixing with the prisoners, two or three hundred of them. In a book written of the Australian pioneers by Mr. Namai Bartley, mention is made of this bird as the ancestral cockatoo, rival of Grip the raven, who lived for forty-five years with the Petries, and was only excelled by the seventy-five-year-old Sulphur Crest, who domiciled with the Sydney Wentworths. Patriarchs there, like the Petries were here, a bird who lived till his bald chest made him fain in the wintry July to singe his featherless bosom by the hearth fire logs. When the late John Petrie, the eldest son, was a boy, in fact not long after the arrival of the family in Brisbane, Cocky, then a little fledgling, was presented to him by a prisoner named Skinner, a man who was a sort of overseer over other prisoners. The little bird thrived and flourished, and as he grew, he learned to speak most distinctly. One could never mistake what he said. Indeed, people sometimes would hardly believe that the voice was that of a bird. He picked up almost anything in the way of talking, and could also, of course, swear beautifully, as the prisoners did. Cocky was a white cockatoo, and was a big, handsome, pretty bird. He walked along proudly, and called himself Jack's cocky, sometimes Jack's pretty cocky. If caught at any mischief, it was then Jack's poor cocky. He evidently thought he could stave off punishment so. An amusement cocky had was to sit on the fence and call all the fowls round him. When they had gathered together, he would cackle like a hen, then laugh as though jeering at them. He was a great bird to laugh, and generally ended his mirth with an awful screech. He could also whistle well, and would whistle for the dogs and call, Here, here, then bark and jeer at them. Cats also he teased, Puss, puss, poor puss, puss, he would say in an insinuating sort of fashion, then would pinch their tails and meow. If he saw a black fellow, it was, Balu yaka, balu tobacco. The natives used to sing and dance for Cocky, and the bird would try and mimic them, bobbing his yellow-crowned head up and down and jumping in a sort of dance. Indeed, there was one blackfellow's song of which he knew a part. The darkies would be very amused and laugh at him. Then Cocky too would laugh and say, Baal, you budgery. Like most birds, Cocky was very fond of being scratched, and he seemed as though he would keep a person scratching him all day if they were only willing. He would first remark, Scratch Cocky. Then, when that was done, turning his old head around and directing with his claw, it was, Just here. Then, again in another place, Just here. And lastly, he held up his wing with a request to scratch Cocky's blanket. His wing was always his blanket. In those days, a gentleman owned a garden on Kangaroo Point, opposite Petrie's Bight. A Highlander worked this garden and sold the cabbages he grew there. 
When anyone on the north side wished to buy vegetables, they went down to the river's bank and called, Boat ahoy! Cabbage! And the man would answer, Aye, aye! And pull over with a load. One day John Petrie saw Cocky walking along extra proudly down towards the river, and he thought by the bird's strut as he put one foot out after the other that some mischief was afloat, so watched. He saw Cocky climb up a wattle tree which grew on the bank, and settling himself there, call, Boat ahoy! Cabbage! The old man on the opposite side made answer, Ay, ay! And after a little, arrived with cabbages in his boat. Seeing no one, he turned about in a surprised sort of fashion, and presently discovered Cocky, who then began to laugh and screech at him. The man fell into an awful rage at this, and swore at the bird, who, however, but laughed the more. In the end, John Petrie had to come forward from where he watched to the rescue, and buy a few cabbages for the sake of peace. In the same way, many a time Cocky would bring the ferryman from Kangaroo Point across to the north side all for nothing. This is a well-known fact. He would fly to a tree on the bank of the river and call, Over! Father has seen the ferryman come across and go up the bank and look about to see who called, then, finding no one, start to return, swearing to himself at being made a fool of. When he got a few boat lengths away from the shore, there would be another, Over! And the ferryman, this time seeing the bird, would swear still more and threaten to wring his impudent neck if he caught him. Cocky, however, was too smart. He seemed to know well when anyone was in a scot and would fly away home after his jeer and laugh. He had a marvellous power with his voice. It is said to be perfectly true that one day he almost backed a horse and dray into the river. Someone coming up just saved it in time. He would say, Wah! back, etc., in the most natural manner possible. Cocky had a very strong beak. People he didn't like had cause to think it a terrible beak, for these he pecked viciously at times. He could open oysters easily, would just break off the edge, then put in his beak and prise the shell open, afterwards eating the oyster. Also it was an easy matter for him to open those windows which shove upwards, worked on pulleys, unless they were extra stiff. He would work his beak in under the bottom of the window, then shove up the lower sash far enough to get his head in. People inside generally helped him then. One wretchedly cold day, Grandfather Petrie happened to be in the sitting room when he saw Cocky come and tried to open one of the windows there. It, however, happened to be stiff, so the bird gave up and went round off to a bedroom window. Succeeding there, he shoved in his head, saying, Poor Cocky, it's devilish cold. A son of the house was in this room, and Grandfather, when he heard what the bird had said, laughed very heartily. As I have said, there are a good many people still living who remember old Cocky and his ways. Those who knew him best say he was a strange bird, and seemed human in the way he understood things. My mother says the first time she saw him, he rather embarrassed her by asking, who are you? in a tone of voice as though she had no business near him. If he came out with any expression he had learnt, it was sure to fit the occasion. One day a pilot from the bay came to Andrew Petrie's house to talk over some business. Dinner was just about to be served, and he was taken in to have a meal with the family. He was a great drunkard, this pilot, and happened to be rather unsteady that day, so Mr. Petrie remonstrated and lectured him for his bad habit. Cocky, generally, when there was a stranger in the room, perched himself as though to listen on the back of a chair the newcomer sat on. So here he was, of course, in the pilot's chair. He seemed to listen to the lecture with his head on one side. Then, as the pilot promised to try and do better, You ought to be ashamed of yourself, he said. So I thought, Cocky, said the man, turning around. Ashamed of yourself was a great expression with Cocky. On this occasion all the family sat round the table. The only two who are now left, Mrs. Ferguson and my father, remember the circumstance well. Round towards the back of the house, near the office door, a half cask of pipe clay stood, and Cocky loved to get into this cask and work away with his beak, imagining he was very busy like the workman 
digging and throwing up the earth as they did. One morning John Petrie put him down near this cask, saying, Go on, cocky, to your work. The bird jumped up onto the edge of the cask, then down to the pipe clay, on top of a rat which had sheltered there. Cocky got an awful scare as the rat moved, and was up onto the edge of the cask again instantly, then turning and looking down at the rat, with his feathers ruffled and his topknot up. What the devil are you doing there? he said. One can imagine how John Petrie stood and laughed, and laughed again, helpless, while the offending rat made his escape. Years afterwards there was another small cask which Cocky played in, this time an empty one, except for some little bits of sticks and rubbish which the bird loved to break up with his beak. At present, Andrew Petrie, member for Tom Bull, grandson to the old gentleman, tells this story. He, a boy at the time, discovered, with some other youngsters, a cat with kittens in this cask, which was Cocky's special property. It was in the morning before the bird's usual time of working there, so the boys looked for some fun and watched to see what would happen when Cocky came along. The bird climbed up the cask in the usual manner, and gaining the top he put his head over, preparatory to climbing in. The cat, of course, resented this, and spitting viciously, she threw up her paw and hit Cocky on the side of the head. The frightened bird waited for no more, but climbed down again instantly, muttering all the time, Poor puss, puss, poor puss, puss, poor puss, puss. The boys, of course, screamed with laughter, and Cocky, the moment he was safely on the ground, exclaimed, Ball budgery! Hip, hip, hooray! One cannot describe the comical effect of a cheer from Cocky. He always threw up his top knot when he came to hooray. He kept away from this cask for some time afterwards. Wouldn't go near it. The Miss Petrie of those days had a king parrot who was a great pet and was very clever. He could call each of the three dogs of the household by their right names. This bird lived for about nine years and then took cramps. Finding him unable to stand one day in his cage, his mistress took him out, saying, Poor Joey, poor fellow, and Cocky was walking about watching. Miss Petrie doctored her bird, then put him on her bed on a piece of flannel. Cocky followed and, catching the counterpane in his beak, climbed up onto the bed, then lifting Joey's covering, looked at him and said, Poor Joey, poor fellow, then he climbed down again and walked off. Cocky picked up any word or expression he heard very quickly. He was always surprising people. On one occasion, down by the side of the road in front of the house, two men lounged, idly talking. Cocky, noticing the pair, strutted down to them and inquired, What ship? Then he commenced to talk. Jack's cocky. Jack's poor pretty cocky too, me boy, he said. The men got him to make friends. Then, bringing him up to the house, told them there, The bird wanted to know what ship we came in, and said he was Jack's pretty cocky. Cocky listened to this with head on one side, then broke in with, Baal you yucca, Baal you tobacco. Cocky could say all the names of the family. In the morning, when Andrew Petrie walked along the veranda to call his son George, Cocky, hearing the footfalls and the sound of the walking stick, never waited for the voice, but would be the first in calling, Geordie, Geordie, rapping his beak on the floor in imitation of the sound of the stick. My grandfather had many a laugh at this. A working man called Johnny Bishop could imitate a drunken man very well. He often used to come to Cocky and assume drunkenness for the sake of hearing the birds string on a lot of swears at him and say, You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Poor Cocky, he was often teased. The wild young squatters used to laugh at him, and he would chase them. When he chased anyone, he always said, Sool him, and then would bark like a dog. One day these squatters poured gin and water down the poor bird's throat, and this evidently made him tight, for he could not stand. Always afterwards he would run from a glass even of water, and the squatters laughingly declared, he was a teetotaler forever. Whenever Cocky had done anything wrong, he always wanted to kiss, one knew so that he had been in mischief and was afraid of being punished. 
He was a terrible bird for destroying furniture, and often narrowly escaped being killed for the damage he did in that as in other ways. Once a large brick oven in the house was repaired. The workmen, when they had finished, went off, leaving everything all right, but the mortar, of course, was wet. Cocky, when their backs were turned, set to work, and using his powerful beak, gradually loosened the key bricks, causing the whole thing to fall in, and how the bird escaped is a marvel. All the work had to be done over again. Another similar trick at another time, he played upon the Petri's washerwoman. She had the clothes out drying, and when her back was turned, Cocky, climbing along the line, pulled out every peg thereon, causing the clean clothes to fall to the ground. The washerwoman, who was a one-time convict, used some rather choice language when she saw what had happened. Cocky had a perch up under the kitchen veranda, where it was boarded in, and here he made a little hole where he could put his head out. Was very busy making this hole, worked at it every night till finished. From here he could see the ferry and anyone passing to it. It was a great thing then for a person who wished to be funny to call, Hey! Then when the other looked around, that slewed you. Cocky picked this up and would do it beautifully to passers-by. Some of them got quite angry with him. The moment he got anyone to look, he would bob his old head out of sight. The present Andrew Petrie says he has often heard Dr. Hobbs say Cocky had him many a time, by either a whistle or a call. One day, by some means or other, Cocky fell in the river and would have been drowned but for his wings. He was discovered calling, Jack's poor Cocky, and at his rescue was terribly excited, repeatedly kissing and saying, Kiss, poor Cocky, Jack's poor Cocky. Cocky hated to see people barefooted. The sight of bare feet irritated and made him savage, and he would chase the owner. He also hated the doctor with immense hatred and went for him. At one time my father's brother Andrew was ill in bed, and Cocky took it upon himself to sit alongside the sufferer, of whom he was very fond because of being fed by him. He would sometimes even get under the blankets, and whenever anyone went near the bed, Cocky got very cross and swore at and chased the intruder. Then when Dr. Hobbs came along, he vented his rage on him. He would no sooner be put out at the door than he was ran at the window, which, if closed, he prized open with his beak, and there he was in the room again and at the doctor. So he had to be shut up in a cage till the doctor left. During his imprisonment he continually called, Ball Budgery, Jack's pretty cocky, kiss poor cocky. Cocky seemed to know when anyone was ill. All the time my grandmother was laid aside before her death, he spent part of each day at her bedhead, watching to see that no one came near, and now and then saying, Poor fellow. When she died he was present, and afterwards seemed quite dull for a day or two. It was almost as though he knew something. He went on in the same way years afterward when the old gentleman died. They could not keep him out of the room, and when the coffin was brought in, he flew fiercely at those who went to lift the body. The poor bird had to be shut up out of the way. He was found, however, afterwards, on the edge of the coffin, looking down into it, and was heard to remark, Poor fellow, before he got down and walked away. Although Cocky was forty-five years old when he died, he might have lived even much longer but for an accident he had. One day he perched himself on a half-cask of pitch and somehow fell into it. It was a hot day and the pitch was soft, and in the struggle to get out the feathers on the bird's breast got stuck and pulled out. They never grew again. So in the summer he had to be put in a cage and covered with a net, as the mosquitoes tormented him very much. Then in winter it was a piece of work to keep him warm. The unfortunate bird fell into a habit of continually picking his bare chest, which made it bleed. Though he lived this way for years, at last he looked so miserable that it was thought truer kindness to put an end to his misery, so a stranger was paid to do the deed. This, then, was the last of poor old Cocky. To the older members of the Petri family yet living, it is a sort of sacrilege in a way, 
to laugh at or doubt any of the tales told of Cocky. But yet they realized that it must be difficult for people who did not know him to understand how a bird could come to such perfection. My father will talk of him, then say, but people won't believe that. They will think it all bosh. And his nephew, Andrew Petrie, says, Never have I seen such a bird since. I have come across many a clever bird on steamers and elsewhere, but never has one been able to touch old Cocky. He was truly marvelous. He was a great bird to take off people. Many a time when I sang as a boy, Cocky would mimic me, then laugh and jeer. Often the blacks brought in tiny young cockatoos for us, and Cocky would go upstairs to where they were and feed them just as a parent bird does. Then he would make exactly the noise they did and laugh over it. There was a little pet pig, too, he was very fond of. He often carried food to it. Once these two were found getting drunk together, a cask of beer was leaking, and Piggy was sucking up the liquid while Cocky caught the drops with his beak. Poor Cocky. I used to be amused at the way he would climb up father's chair, then pull his sleeve and say, Jack, if no notice were taken, he kept at it till he got the answer. Well, what is it? Give Cocky a piece of bread. Governor Cairns, when he came to Queensland, had heard so much about Cocky that he asked to be taken to see him. Poor Cocky was then very disreputable looking with his bare chest and young Andrew was rather ashamed to show him. However, he brought the bird forth and made him talk a little, saying to His Excellency that he was Jack's poor pretty cockatoo, my boy. But his best days were over then. End of Part 2, Chapter 9「Section 34 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hopeful Swan. Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland. Part 2, Chapter 10. After the settlement was thrown open in 1842, Mr. Andrew Petrie's office was of course abolished, and Colonel Barney and others, recognizing that gentleman's ability, endeavored to persuade him to return to Sydney and continue under the government there. However, taking an interest in Queensland, he preferred remaining where he was to try his luck in what he foresaw would become a flourishing colony. Therefore, he started business on his own account, contracting for government and other buildings, and here his engineering and architectural training stood him in good stead. In 1848, while on a trip to the Downs, Mr. Petrie caught Sandy Blight, which was prevalent at the time. His eyes got very bad, and though everything was tried to cure them, nothing seemed to work. Being an active man, he became impatient at the waste of time consequent, and though his wife begged him to await a while and rest, he insisted upon going to the doctors. Simple remedies in time, no doubt, would have worked a cure. The doctors in those early days were not as skillful as they are now. My father, then a boy of about 17 years, remembers leading his father to the hospital which stood where the Supreme Court is now, and there they went in to the doctors to see what could be suggested, my grandfather saying, whatever you do, don't cut anything. Oh no, was the reply, but the boy saw one of them take up a small pair of tweezers and catching hold of the skin or scum which had formed over the site. He held it while the other cut through with another instrument. Then caustic was put in the eyes, and the doctors declared that though it would pain a little, everything would come right, and Mr. Petrie would be able to see. All the way home, however, the poor gentleman was in great pain, and that whole night through he walked his room in agony, and one of his eyes burst. Father could never forget that awful time afterwards, 
and to this day he thinks his father's sight may have been saved under different treatment. Some time after, when the pain had gone from his eyes, my grandfather was taken to Sydney to see if the doctors there could do any good. They told him that one eye was quite hopeless, the sight was gone altogether, but there might be some chance with the other. In the latter he always thought he could see a little glimmering, but nothing further ever came of it. It is a pitiful thing when a strong acting man loses his eyesight. When Mr. Andrew Petrie realized that he would never see again, his agony and suffering must have been frightful, for he could not become reconciled just at first. It was a sad, sad time for his wife, who had to comfort him and witness his struggle, helpless to effect a cure. He was only 50 years of age at the time, and had always been used to leading others, so that the eternal darkness facing him must naturally have been almost more than he could bear. Could he have known he was to live a blind man for 24 years, being nearly 74 at his death? However, in time it was wonderful how he managed. People marveled at his aptitude. He was always at work with his mind, my father says. I have seen him when tenders were called for erecting a building or bridge, etc., getting my brother John to explain the plans and read the specifications to him. Then he would take a slate and with the forefinger of the left hand on the top of the slate, he wrote the cross, moving down his finger each time he finished a line until both sides were filled. He never crossed the lines and would state the quantity of timber required, the amount of nails, and everything else needful, or if it was something to be built of brick or stone, he was scarcely out in a brick, etc. Indeed, he was very seldom out in his reckoning. Father goes on to say that his father always rang the workman's bell at 8 o'clock, then again at 1 and 2 and 6. He gave all the men their orders for the day. He knew each by their step and called them by their names. To one drayman he would say to take so many loads of loam to the scene of action and to another so much sand, lime or bricks. And then the carpenters, blacksmiths and sawyers got their orders. Going to the carpenter shop he would feel the work being done all over and knew at once if it was correct. They could not deceive him. In the same way he went to the blacksmiths and stonemasons, and I have heard the men say they would sooner see anyone coming into the shop to examine their work than father. He said if anything was wrong or not finished off properly, he would find it out by feeling, for he knew where a joint should be or a nail driven and was never imposed upon, but would have things done properly at all costs. He always carried a walking stick and at times would use it when displeased. But in a moment or two his temper was gone, and asking for a piece of board, he drew on it with chalk, the shape of the molding or anything that they were making, explaining how it was to be done and all about it, telling them to be sure and work correctly. Mr. Andrew Petrie was led every day to all the buildings and other works under construction. He was never satisfied till he went the rounds to see what was required for the next day. His son, John, after a time had a pony broken in for him to save any walking, for he had a sore leg. Before leaving the old country his thigh was broken, while riding a young horse from his work in Edinburgh. The animal shied and ran him into a cab. The young fellow's leg got caught in the spokes of the wheel and was broken and also the shin and side of the leg above the ankle was very much skinned and bruised. The broken part, thigh, was set and recovered, but the bruise on the leg would heal up and then break out again. And years afterwards, when his sight was gone, it was very bad at times. One could almost see the bone of this leg, father remarks, but my father would never lay up with it. Though you could see that it pained him sometimes very much, he would never give in. He had a great spirit as well as an active mind, and his memory was splendid. He often gave us his sons 
little things to do and remember, and though he perhaps forgot all about them, he never did, and would afterwards ask had we done such and such a thing. When I told him I'd forgotten, he would say the wretched tobacco smoke had taken all my brains away. A boy led the pony on which my father rode round to the different works in progress, and you would see him taken to a ladder leaning on a two-story building, up which he would climb just as though he could see. Getting to the top and onto a plank, he would poke about with his stick on the sides and all along the plank, then all over the building, feeling with it the different parts of the work, and all the men had to do was to tell him what portion of the building he was on, and he seemed to know where each piece of timber should be fixed and where every joint should be. It was wonderful to see him going over a building. He had a grand head, much better than any of us, his sons. His leg never got well, though it healed up somewhat before his death. He was very independent with regard to this leg and dressed, washed and bandaged it himself night and morning seldom allowing anyone else to touch it. In the same year in which Mr. Andrew Petrie lost his eyesight, 1848, his son Walter was drowned in the one time creek from which Creek Street now takes its name. In those early days, Mr. Petrie ran a couple of pumps, one of which was employed in carrying stone used for buildings from the hard stone quarry at Kangaroo Point also sand and shells from the bay for lime making. The other journeyed to Ipswich with Fleur, etc. for Walter Gray's door and brought back tallow and bales of wool. On one occasion the latter was loaded and ready to start, but lay at anchor opposite Kangaroo Point, waiting for the tide, which would not suit till eight o'clock. And Walter Petrie, a boy of 22, intended making the trip in charge of the boat as the headman was ill and had gone down the township before the hour of departure to visit some friends and get some tobacco. When eight o'clock came round, however, there was no sign of the young fellow and one of the crew, former prisoners on board, wondering what he should do, went ashore at last to ask instructions. Mr. Petrie started off at this to look for his son, saying to Tom to come along and they would find him. Father remembers well leading his blind father to a number of different places, and at last he came to a friend who said a young fellow had been there some hours previously, leaving with the intention of going to the boat. That night, no trace was found. Next morning, Mrs. Petrie with one of those unexplained insights into the unseen, said that her son would never be found alive, for he was drowned down in the creek, and she pointed her hand as she spoke. Her remark was, however, made light of, the hearers little suspecting how true it was, the boy being a splendid swimmer. In the meantime, a story had been started, born quickly like a bubble, as empty tales are at those times, that the young fellow had run away. The boat waiting to start was sent off, and Tom took his brother's place. Whether it was because of his mother's remark, he does not know. But all the time the boy had the same strange feeling that water was drowned. And going up the river, everything he saw floating gave him a turn. At that time, R.G. Smith's boiling down works had opened under Bremer, and after entering that river, the boat's party came upon a dead body floating a little way ahead. I thought it was him, says my father, and I nearly dropped, but when we got up to it, it was a dead sheep with the wool all off floating in the water. Then when we got to Ipswich, I was told that my brother had been found drowned in the creek at Brisbane on the same day as I had seen the sheep. Strange but true is the following, which illustrates still further the strong feeling which Mrs. Petrie had with regard to her son's disappearance. In those days a small scrub grew on the north bank of the creek, just behind where the commercial bank is now, at the corner of Queen and Creek Streets. Before any trace was found of the missing lad, 
two men were sent by Mr. Petrie to this scrub for vines for binding up shingles, which were always bound, so then in bundles the vines being twisted into the shape of hoops. And Mrs. Petrie, hearing the order, she had never been out of the house all this time, called after them, You will find my poor boy down there in the creek. And then she persisted in watching the man, for from the doorway the creek could be seen. Her daughter stayed by her side, seeking to draw her away, but the poor lady was in such a dazed condition that she seemed unable to think of anything but her lost son. She watched as the man reached the creek, then noticing them pause and draw back. They have found him now, she said. The man returned and asked for Mr. Petrie. Why do you ask that, she said. I know what has brought you. You have found my boy. All the time she was unable to weep, and they had to take her away to another part of the house. Mr. Petrie himself had discredited the idea of drowning, saying water was too good a swimmer, and now the shock seemed to come to him twofold. Pitiful it must have been to see the poor blind gentleman going to his wife's side as he did when he heard the truth and the body having been in the water, he could not even have the comfort of feeling his son for the last time, the bonny boy who was a favorite with all. It was found afterwards that the young fellow had gone to cross the bridge, or rather apology for one, which spanned the creek opposite to where Campbell's warehouse is now, and the logs being wet, for it had been raining, he slipped and fell. The bridge was originally composed of three long logs put across the creek, then slabs on top and dirt covering all. But at this time the dirt had fallen off, and also nearly all the slabs lay beneath in the mud. As the young fellow crossed to take the shortcut to the boat, simply as such accidents happen, he slipped in the dark, though he may have crossed safely a hundred other times, and falling head foremost, on to the slabs, it was slow tide. He was stunned and lay unconscious. Indeed, from the examination afterwards, it was said his neck was broken. However, he lay there all alone in the dark while he sought for him in other places. And the water which knew him so well, and in which he had learned to swim, rose slowly and laughed against the stalwart young form as though to rouse it. Then, gaining no answer and growing bolder, the tide lifted and carried the lad up the creek to where he was afterwards found. Of all Andrew Petrie's children, Walter was the only fair one with blue eyes, and he was said to be exceedingly handsome. Grandfather himself was fair, but my grandmother, who was a Cuthbert's son, was dark and a very big woman. They thought it wisest not to let her see her dead son but she would not be comforted otherwise, and the sight proved too much. That is not my boy, she insisted, and then the mother lost consciousness. It was a very peculiar coincidence, but nine years afterwards, at the end of 1857, in the same creek, another Walter, a little son of John Petrie, was drowned, the first Walter being 22 years, while the second was a baby of 22 months. The child's accident also happened at a broken bridge, though it was further up the stream. In fact, it stood in the present Queen Street, near where Shaw's iron laundry shop used to be, now occupied by Russell Wilkins. The boy wandered off from his nurse, and she, being sent to seek him, came upon the little shack drowned in the creek. The alarm was given, and the body was recovered quickly but life was extinct. In that part the water was only five or six feet deep. Walter Petrie, as I have said, was only 22 years of age when he met his death, and he was an exceptionally strong young fellow. His brother Tom says of him, I have seen Walter take 200 pound bags of fleur, one under each arm, and walk by a plank on board a pond with them. Also many a time, in my presence, has he taken a blacksmith's sledgehammer by the handle and held it out at arm's length. He was a splendid swimmer, learning the art with his brothers and not many yards from where he fell. And had the water been high when he attempted to cross the logs, 
all would have been well. Before his death, Walter Petrie used, with his brother John, to row a great deal in the early boat races. The sport was very different then to what it is now. The boats were heavy and ungainly, and the races were consequently won by sheer strength. Boats after the style of a present-day ferry boat were used for one occupant, and both Walter and John won many of these single-handed races. Then together they pulled in the whale boat at events with an equal success, their boat being called the Lucy Long. Whale boats held five oarsmen always, and another man who stood up and used the steer oar, holding it in his left hand, while with his right he assisted the stroke. Such races would look odd in these days, of course, but my father says a whale boat race was well worth watching. The men all kept good time, feathering their oars alike and so on. The course taken was from the colonial stores, Queen's Wharf, down to the garden point, where a buoy was anchored, then round the buoy and back to the point on South Brisbane, Brisbane above the present commercial shed then called Wormsley Point after a sawyer who used to cut timber there. Another boy was anchored here and the course continued round it then back home to the wharf. When John Petrie was pulling in these races he acted as stroke. By way of variety what was called a dinghy race was indulged in. It was great fun. The dinghy only held one man of course and John Petrie was very often chosen because of his aptitude. He was allowed so many yards start, and the idea was that the bowman in the whale boat following had to catch him within a certain length of time, about 12 minutes. When the whale boat got close to the dinghy, the latter would spin round like a top, and the big boat lost ground in turning after it, and so they went on until, if the whale boat got too near, the pursued man jumped overboard and dived beneath his opponent's boat. Bo followed after, diving also, but when John Petrie was in the race, he was seldom caught before time was up, as he was a grand swimmer and diver in those days, and very few could catch him in the water. Of course, there was no bridge across the river then. Being a good deal younger, my father was out of these races, but he witnessed them nevertheless. Another exciting event to remember in this connection was a race between two lots of natives. Each crew occupied a whale boat, and the prize was a bag of fleur and some tea and sugar. It was a splendid race and well pulled, the winners who were Amity Point Blacks being the others Brisbane tribe by a length. The successful crew were fine, big, strong men and good pullers, having had more practice than their Brisbane brethren, as they mostly had belonged to the pilot's boat's crew. That night in camp there was much feasting, the prize being greatly appreciated. End of part two, chapter 10, recording by Hope Force One. Part 2, Chapter 11 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, recorded by his daughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As an instance of the great changes which have taken place in Brisbane in even less than one lifetime, it is interesting to follow my father's experiences of the way in which shells and coral for lime making were obtained when he was a boy. As already mentioned, a punt did the carting from the bay, and as a protection to them from the blacks, Tom was sent with the crew. For being so well known among the darkies, the lad was a safeguard to anyone in his company. The shells used were obtained from the sandy point on the Humpybong side of the mouth of the Pine River, where they were plentiful then in the required dry, dead state. And this point the blacks called Kulakan, Pelican, because at low water the bank there was crowded with pelicans. 
four men besides my father manned the boat and they went with the ebb down the river, anchoring at the mouth till the tide turned again and came up some two feet, thus enabling the party to surmount the difficulty of sandbanks. Planks were fixed along each side of the punt so that the men could walk from end to end and each man had a long light pole with which to shove the boat along. They kept in as close to the shore as was possible and so with the help of the tide got slowly along past where Sandgate is now onwards to the mouth of the pine, farther steering. Four baskets made by old Bribey, the basket maker, also two or three rakes to gather together the shells, formed part of the punt's outward going cargo, and two men would fill the baskets while the remaining pair carried them into the water, dipping them up and down to rid the shells of all sand. The punt was left dry on the beach as the water receded, but the tide coming up again would float her when she was laden. Sometimes natives were present and they helped with the work, their payment being tobacco and flour. Almost always the homeward start was made at night. As it was calmer then and as the tide rose, the men poled away along the shore till they got into the river, the tide carrying them there. The outgoing journey was commenced at night too, generally. Coral for the lime making was obtained in much the same way from King Island, or Winham, breadfruit, as the blacks called it then. The punt was taken through the boat passage and kept close to the land all the way, being poled along the shore as before in the night hours, then over to the island. These punts held big loads, but later their place was taken by a cutter Mr. Petrie had built for the purpose and for carrying oysters from the oyster banks for the lime. Lime burning was carried out at Petrie's Bight, and there also the cutter was built. When writing of the habits of the Aborigines, I have mentioned how my father as a youngster used to spend hours day after day in the water with the black boys, diving as amusement for white bones and pebbles. This made him very dexterous and so whenever there was a difficult water drop in those days, he was in great request. The first thing he remembers tackling was a large steam boiler which had sunk in a pump during the night of the wharf where Thomas Brown and Sons Warehouse is now. The punt lay on a slant, one end being some 20 feet beneath the water and the other six feet. And my father had to try to see where a chain could be got under the boiler to rise it. He went down in the chain which was fastened to another large punt on the surface and this is his description of the experience. Quote, the water was very clear and I could see as well as if out of it. Coming to the lower end after going along holding to the boiler, I let go to come up and although I could see the light above, thought I would never reach the surface. And when I did arrive there was pretty well out of breath. After a rest, I started down again, taking with me a small line by which to pull the chain under the boiler. I succeeded in getting the line under and came back along the chain, making sure that I would get up this time all right. The men in the punt above pulled on the line and then I went down again and pushed the chain under and they pulled again and were successful in getting it through. The chains were fastened to the punt above during low water. So of course, as she rose with the tide, the punt beneath was lifted too. End quote. 
Another water job was undertaken after a large flood which carried away what was then Harris's Wharf in the present Short Street, next to where Pettigrew's Mill stood. The wharf was taken a good many yards into the river and it had to be raised. So a punt was put alongside with sheer legs attached to hoist the logs. And father went down time after time and put a chain round one by one. And he also prized them asunder with a crowbar. A man called Tom Collins, a bricklayer, assisted by sitting astride a log in the water and he handed the crowbar and chain as they were wanted thus saving a lot of swimming on the young fellow's part. The man himself could not swim, but, says my father, quote, he was a good worker, they very fond of his nip. At this time, it was rather cold to be in the water every day, and the work went on for some two months. So they used to give Collins a glass of grog each morning before work, and then again when he knocked off. One day, however, this little attention was neglected, and as it happened to be extra cold, Collins informed me that he would make them give him his usual. So, crawling along the log to the shore, he tumbled off into the mud. Then, picking himself up and putting his tongue out of me, scrambled up the bank and into the store. Up the stairs he went, shivering and shaking, the mud and water dripping from him, and when they saw him there, for oh, glory's sake, go down out of this. See what a mess you're making. But the dirty, wet object only shivered and shook the more, and making his teeth chatter, he gasped, I can't go to you give me a glass of grog. To get him out of their sight was all they thought of, so he triumphantly returned to me, wagging his tongue and carefully fondling a bottle of gin under his arm. I'll be all right now, he said, and be able to hold the bar fine and steady. End quote. Collins, sitting there on the log in the water, dangling his legs, must have cut rather a comical figure, and people who came and paused to the on would call to ask what he was doing. No, oh, I'm holding a lamp under the water so that the chap below can see to prise some logs apart, would be his reply. Poor Collins, his fondness for a nip ended his days. For many years after he sat there on the log, he was found one day quite dead on the bank of the Bremer River, his head in the water. And it was supposed that being drunk, he lay down to try and get a drink, failing miserably in the attempt to rise again. If the water had been clear and warm during this work, things would have been much more pleasant. But Father says it was full of floating dead fish after the flood, and to come up and strike one with his face was anything but nice. At this time, he wore a ring made on the Bendigo diggings from pure gold he had found there himself. And one day, while working in the water, a chain caught this ring and knocked it off his finger. He dived, but could not find it, being unable to see in the muddy water. So a day or two afterwards, got a couple of blacks to come along and try. They were also unsuccessful, though trying a long time. So the ring was given up for lost. However, on the Saturday afternoon, when work was done, my father, feeling sad about the ring because of its associations, said to Collins, I will try once more for that ring. The water is low and I know just where it dropped. With that, in he jumped. And the first thing he felt when touching the bottom was the ring on a stone. The young fellow's delight can be imagined. This reads somewhat like romance, but it is all quite true. And one of my father's daughters now wears the ring, he having had it cut to fit her finger. 
To go further with its history, I may add, the ring was lost a second time. For months it lay on a lawn, and when hope was given up, it caught one day on the prongs of a rake a gardener was wielding. Yet another piece of waterwork will I mention. This time the scene was the Bremer River, and the first Roman Catholic church was being erected at Ipswich. A punt laden with shingles and freestone for the building sank one night when only about 20 yards from the bank, having sprung a leak. Father was sent up with two natives to do the diving. And he first of all went down to find out how the punt lay so that he could fix the position of the floating punt above. Then poles were put down to enable the divers to judge where to come up safely, the water being muddy, and they took it in turns to get the shingles up with the help of shear legs. This did not take much time, but the stones were more troublesome. They were heavy. Some of them my father could not move when on land, but beneath the water could lift an end and so get the sling fixed. One day he says, one of the darkies in coming up got under the floating punt and you could hear him bump, bump on the bottom. We thought it was a case for him, but he bumped all along the bottom of the punt till he got to the end, then came up. We caught him and pulled him out and he was nearly done for, but soon recovered. However, nothing would induce the poor fellow to go into the water again so the job had to be finished without him. End of part two, chapter 11. Part two, chapter 12 of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, dating from 1837, recorded by his daughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, Part 2, Chapter 12. Mr. Andrew Petrie had several, quote, old hands, unquote, who had served their time and were free working for him in different ways. One, Cranky Tom, was quite a character and would have served as material for a child's dickens. He used to do odd jobs such as cutting firewood, loading drays, etc. And the poor man was not quite in possession of his senses in all things. He would never sleep in a bed, but would camp beside the kitchen fire. Or if a lime kiln were burning there, for a certainty would he be found rolled up in a blanket, surrounded by dogs. When asked, Tom, what were you sent out to this country for? He invariably answered for pulling the tail of a donkey and beating him with the bloody end of it. One day a dray loaded with timber entered the yard and the dray man called to Cranky Tom to chock the wheel. The stupid man, instead of getting a stone or stick, ran and used his foot as a stop. But it quickly came out again and its owner danced about crying, Oh, my country, what have I suffered for you? The wheel had given him a nasty squeeze, but did not go over the foot. Another time, one Sunday morning, when Jimmy Porter, one of the Prentice boys, got up to light the fire and put the kettle on, he was surprised to find all the kitchen utensils gone. Pots, pans, kettle, cups and saucers, plates, knives, everything even the long iron rake for the ashes. Before the family could breakfast, a messenger had to be sent across for fresh things to the general store, then kept at Kangaroo Point by a man called Davidson. Cranky Tom was suspected of having hidden the utensils, but he could not be found anywhere about the place, so a policeman's help was sought. Father, boy-like, accompanied the bobby and he remembered how they went past Petrie's Bight and as far as to where the Union Hotel stands now in the valley 
and there they came upon Cranky Tom sitting on the roadside laughing and looking quite pleased with himself, his trousers all soiled with pot black. The policeman said to him, Well, Tom, how did you get all that black stuff on your trousers? I don't know. Why did you take all those things out from Mr. Petrie's kitchen, Tom? I done it for a change. Where did you put them? I don't know. After some more, well, I will have to take you to the lockup, and the handcuffs are put on. Going along, the poor fellow began twisting the irons about on his wrists, then suddenly, exploding with laughter, he said, Oh, my country, they don't fit. The police magistrate could get nothing further from Tom than I'd done it for a change. So in the end, he was declared to be insane, and there being no asylum in Queensland, was sent to Sydney. The kitchen utensils hiding place was discovered in this wise. The ferry man crossing the river came upon a couple of the articles floating, so it was at once thought that the whole lot had been thrown into the water, and an old black fellow, Ben Tobin, a head Brisbane man, was got to pick up Cranky Tom's tracks, which he did very soon, and some of the things were discovered by him diving. They had been thrown in just where the steamer from Humpy Bong now lands her passengers. Another man who worked at the same time as Cranky Tom was Deaf Mickey, a small man who was also half silly like Tom. Whenever he got his wages on the Saturday, he would go to the store and buy a week's supply of rations, then repair to the old windmill, as it was then called, being in disuse, and camp there till his fare ran out. Every day between meals, he walked some 200 yards from the mill into the bush, backwards and forwards, speaking to himself and squaring up to a gum tree which stood at the end of his walk, putting up his fists as though to fight it, talking all the time. He made quite a plain beaten track to the tree, and go where you liked, says my father, you would see Mickey walking up and down and fighting with the gum tree. Mickey had a quart pot and pint for his tea and also a bag to hold his rations. When the latter were finished, he would go back to his master and say, Be the Lord, I have been walking about this long time looking for work and can't get any. Please would you give me a job? Then he would work again for another week. He was not a bad worker, but could never be depended on for more than a fortnight at a time before he was off again to fight the trees. It was as good as a play, my father says, to see Mickey and Cranky Tom cross-cutting a log. Many a time he watched the pair. The latter would call, Mickey, pull the saw, you're not pulling it, and laugh at him. His companion would stare with not a smile on his face, then say, I think you're cranky. And Tom would reply, oh my country, I think you're gone in the head, you can't hear. Father would sometimes watch the two unseen and sometimes from pure devilment would egg them on to one another. Once Mickey was sent to Morden Island to work at a building there. It was thought that being away from stores he would keep on longer. However, at the end of a fortnight he took it into his head to walk to Sydney and disappeared for that purpose. No one troubled over him, all feeling sure that he would turn up again when the rations he had taken were finished. It was said that in a week's time he came back, having evidently walked about the island, and going to his former employer said, Be the Lord, I have been walking all over the country looking for work and can't find any. Please will you give me a job? He was put to work, but the manager took the first opportunity of sending him back to Brisbane fearing something might happen to the man when he took it into his head to go off again. Poor Mickey's end was also the asylum. I think, says my father, that both Deaf Mickey and Cranky Tom had been knocked silly in Logan's time with the punishment they got in those days. They both seemed harmless, poor chaps. There is much which is indeed pathetic in this world mixed side by side with the comical.
Another of these old hands was a man called Daly, who was fond of going on the spree. One night the Petrie boys found this man very far gone lying in the yard. So what did they do, after some discussion, but go to the carpenter's shop and get a coffin? And this they carried to Daly and put him in it. In the morning the young jokers got up early to see the fun, and going to where they had left the coffin, found the man sitting up in his gruesome bed talking to himself. They heard him say before they burst out laughing and roused his anger, Oh, Henny, I wonder how long I've been buried. Henny was a favourite word with him, and the boys called him nothing else. Many a bit of fun they had with this man. At another time they nearly frightened him out of his senses by stuffing his old clothes with shavings and hanging the figure to a beam in the doorway. Coming home half drunk, Henny thought, of course, someone had committed suicide, and he bolted. The boys had made the figure most natural looking with boots and hats and all complete. Strange things happened in those days. Old Bob, a sawyer, one time convict or old hand, lived at Kangaroo Point with his wife. They had no children. The wife used to go on the spree now and then. One day she was the worse for drink near her home and making a great noise. So two policemen secured her to take her to the lock-up. A fairy punt was pulled across the river by a rope in those days, and the police got the woman into this punt to take her to the north side. When about to land, the man who held Mrs. Bob let go to hold the rope, and the woman immediately jumped over into the water. However, she was dragged back again and lay down in the punt a wet heap, saying, If you want to take me to the lock-up, you will have to carry me. The devil of foot will I walk. The instruments of the law were compelled to take her at her word and carry her ashore. And finding her still obstinate, one of them went up to Mr. Andrew Petrie's for a wheelbarrow. Picture the scene. The old woman was lifted into the barrow, then one man held her while the other wheeled and there she sat blessing the police and calling them all manner of nice names. And following up this procession, which wended its way up the road, which is now Queen Street, came boys and men laughing and having great fun, my father among them. Can one imagine such a procession now in Queen Street? The policemen took turns to hold and to wheel, and so they went on till they got to about where the town hall is now, to the lock-up, and then the three, the victim and the victimised, disappeared from the eyes of the crowd, Mrs. Bob being detained some twenty-four hours for being, quote, jolly. Sometime after this event, Bob made a bargain with Bill, another sawyer. He handed over his wife to Bill in exchange for a horse and dray. So Bill had someone to cook and wash for him, while Bob had a horse and dray. Prehistoric times, surely. All went well for some months. Then Bill came to Bob, who was carting wood and water for sale, and told him he wanted his property back again. Bob refused flatly, saying it was a fair bargain, and the end of it was that he was summoned to court. My father remembers the case well. The court was held in a room in the old government building, a little above the old archway that stood then in Queen Street. After the evidence was taken on both sides, the police magistrate said that Bob had to give up the horse and dray and take his wife back. Your Worship, Bob said to him, I don't think it's right that I should have to give up the horse and dray, as it was a fair, honest bargain. The magistrate replied, Man, you are not allowed to sell your wife, and you must do as I say. So it was done. And strange to relate, the pair seemed to live very happily together for years after this. A kinder and cleaner woman, one could meet nowhere when away from drink, and no one who called a Bob's Humpy was allowed to pass without a meal. She was a good cook, and an excellent washerwoman, and could do up shirts with anyone. However, the curse of drink on both sides told its tale, and when old age came, the couple had to repair to Dunwich, 
where they died some years back, taking their story with them. Before leaving these days, I should like to mention a peculiar habit the old hands, sawyers, etc. had when boiling their tea in the bush. There were no billies then, but court pots were used, and invariably two little sticks were placed crosswise across the pot. This was done to draw the tea, they said, and the men saw nothing strange in the habit. Milton Graveyard, where Grandfather Petrie was buried, seems a thing of the far past now, but there was a cemetery older still. It was on the opposite side of the street to where the coal chutes are now at Tromer Street Station. There the prisoners and soldiers were buried. Before that again, North Quay had been used, but not sufficiently to be called a cemetery. When the place at Roma Street was disused, four or five men were set to dig up the graves and the bones were moved to Milton. One of these men, his companions related afterwards, a little stout Irishman, coming to a coffin lid, raised it and exposure to the air caused an old grey cap on the skeleton to fall to pieces. Throwing up his hands, the frightened Pat exclaimed as he recovered himself, My good soul, keep your cap on. I'm a poor man like yourself. This Pat, it was said, used to take the coffin boards home to his cottage in the valley, and with them he put up a fine skillion. The boards were cedar and quite sound, although some had been underground for a number of years. And so the big place we now call the valley had its beginning. List of places, names, plants and trees with a few specimens of Aboriginal vocabulary. Place Marumba, T. Petrie's homestead, native name Marumba, native meaning good. Place North Pine Kippering near Blacksmiths, native name Nindor and Genedor, native meaning leech sitting down. Place portion of North Pine River near Railway Bridge, native name Mundin, native meaning fishing net. Place small island from Petrie's below Marumba, native name Gompu. Place site of the former lagoon in Paddock near Gatekeepers North Pine, native name Yimbung native meaning bulrush. Place creek below Marumba, native name Yibri, native meaning put or lay it down. Place spring below Imber Pine North Pine, native name Barimpa, native meaning present place. Place Pocketin River above Imber Pine, native name Bungil, native meaning grass. Place Big Hill near Petrie's Pocket, native name Mudlow Mudlow, native meaning stone stone. Place Cottage Hill, Mouth of Pine, Petrie's Pocket, native name Andorba. Place Sandy Point, Mouth of Pine, North Side, native name Kulukan, native meaning pelican. Place Scotts Point, Humpybong, native name Bandamadu native meaning white clay getting it. Place another point Humpibong, native name Warun. Place Redcliffe part of, native name Cowan Cowan, native meaning blood red like blood. Redcliffe part of, native name Yura, native meaning spotted gum. Place Kabulcha, native name Kabultor, native meaning place of carpet snakes. Place Kabulcha Bribey dialect, native name Wongadum, native meaning, same meaning. Place Narangba, native name Narangba, native meaning small place. Place Stony Creek Narangba, native name Bulba. Place Nuram Nuram Creek, native name Nuram Nuram, native meaning Wart Wart. Place two small mountains above the Lanies, native name Bulburum. Place Sidling Creek, native name Kawongba. Place Mount Sampson, native name Buran, native meaning wind. Place Sampson Vale, native name Tukawampa. Place Rush Creek, native name Bagheera. Place Browns Creek, 
native name Tugui, place Samford, native name Kupirabin, native meaning from Kupi and opossum, place D.L. Brown's land Samford, native name Karandukamari, place Straight Stretch of Water and Nogra near Sale Yards, native name Buyuba, native meaning Leg, Shin, place Mount Kutha, native name Kuta, native meaning Dark, native honey, place Muggle Creek, native name Muggle, native meaning Large Water Lizard, place Tawong near Railway Station, native name Bunaraba, place Bendin River below Indurapilly Bridge, native name Tuong, native meaning black goat sucker, bird. Place Saito Railway Bridge in Indurapilly, native name Mibapa. Place Saito Brigata Hotel, Tuong, native name Juai Joy. Place Indurapilly should be Yindurapilly. Place Yurongapilly should be Yurongpilly, native meaning rain coming. Place West End, native name Karilpa, native meaning place for rats. Place Wulangaba should be Wulongkopa. Place Mount Cotton near Mount Petrie, native name Tungipin, native meaning West Wind. Place Mount Gravatt, native name Kukumabul. Place Norman Creek, native name Kupuram. Place Hemant, Winham dialect, native name Komwa Mandado, native meaning place for curlew. Place Mount Hant, Logan dialect, native name Giranguba, native meaning opossum. Place Queensport, native name Marira. Place Pinkenbar, native name Dumbin. Place New Farm, native name Pinkenbar, native meaning place of the land tortoise. Place White's Hill, Native name Balimba. Place Balimba, native name Tugulawa, native meaning shape of heart, indicating river bend at that spot. Place Buradaban, native name Buradaban, native meaning place of oaks. Place Wulluwin should be Kuluwin. Place Hill, Garrick's House, Bowen Bridge Road, native name Gilbumpa. Place Exhibition and Hospital, native name Wulan, native meaning brim, fish. Place Ashgrove, native name Kalandaban. Place Observatory, native name Will Winpa. Place Breakfast Creek, native name Yawagara. Place Newstead, native name Karakara and Pimbili. Place Breakfast Creek near Railway Bridge, native name Barambin. Place Boggy Creek Eagle Farm, native name Tunkaibu. Place Petrie's Bight, native name Tumamum. Place Nanda, native name Nanda, native meaning chain of waterholes. Place Nanda Racecourse, native name Gilwumpa. Place Nanda, site of former German mission, native name Tumbu. Place Sandgate, native name Wara, native meaning open sheet of water or river. Place Nudgy, native name Mergen Mergen. Place Tingalpa, native name Timgalpa, native meaning place of fat. Place Amity Point, native name Pulan. Place Swan Bay, native name Widji Widji P. Place Kanaipa, native name Kanaipa. Place St. Helena, native name Nogun, place Mud Island, native name Bangamba, place Green Island, native name Milwapa, place Strabrook Island near South Passage, native name Dumba, place Cape Morton, native name Kanemba, place Winham, native name Winham, native meaning breadfruit, place Dunwich, native name Gumpy, place Morton Island, native name Mulgumpin, Place Manly, native name Nalo. Place Kuchimadlo Island, native name Kuchimadlo, native meaning red stone. Place Ipswich, native name Tulmo. Place Goodna, native name Goodna. 
native meaning dung. Place Brisbane, Garden Point from the bridge round to Creek Street, taking in the settlement, native name Mianjin. Place Gimpy, Wide Bay dialect, native name Gimpy, native meaning stinging tree. Place Pialba, Wide Bay dialect, native name Pilba, native meaning butcher bird. Place Noosa Head, native name Wantima, native meaning rising or climbing up. Place Portion of Scrub at Malula, native name Jippy, native meaning bird. Maruchi dialect, place Nambour, native name Nambour, native meaning tea tree bark. Place Badaram Mountain, native name Badaram, native meaning honeysuckle. Place Yandina, native name Yandina, native meaning small place of water. Place Torbell Point, native name Ningi Ningi, native meaning oysters. Bribey Island Passage. Place White Patch, native name Tarangiri, native meaning leg. Place Oyster Camp Reserve, native name Banya. Place Long Island, native name Lulu, native meaning small. Place Glass Mountain Creek, native name Baki Bomen. Native meaning stone standing up. Place Kuchin Creek. Native name Kuchi. Native meaning red paint. Glass House Mountains. 1. Biwa, up in the sky, Brisbane dialect. 2. Bibaram, parrot, Maruchi dialect. Ningunbarum, neck crooked, Brisbane dialect. Or Kunnawarum, neck crooked, Maruchi dialect. Chibukaran, squirrel biting, Brisbane dialect. Tunabulabula, mountain two, Maruchi dialect. Guinea, lawyer cane, Maruchi dialect. Tree or plant. Bunya pine, native name Bunyi, scientific name Arkeria bidwilii. Tree or plant, pine, similar to New Zealand kari, native name Dandarum. Scientific name Agatus robusta. Plant Cypress pine, native name Burugari. Scientific name Calitrus columnularis. Plant Morton Bay pine, native name Kumbacho. Scientific name Aracaria cunninghamii. Plant Red ironbark, native name Bika. Scientific name Eucalyptus siderifolia. Plant iron bark narrow leaved, native name Tandur, scientific name Eucalyptus crebra. Plant blue gum, native name Munga, scientific name Eucalyptus teriticornis. Plant spotted gum, native name Nura, scientific name Eucalyptus macalata. Plant stringy barks, native name Dura. Scientific name Eucalyptus acminioides. Plant bloodwood. Native name Buna. Scientific name Eucalyptus corimbosa. Plant swamp mahogany. Native name Bolochu. Scientific name Tristania suaviolens. Plant fig box. Native name Tapulpala. Scientific name Tristania conferta. Plant cedar red. Native name Mamin, scientific name Sidra Tuna. Plant Morton Bay Chestnut, native name Mai, scientific name Castanosperma in Australia. Plant Morton Bay Ash, native name Kuran, scientific name Eucalyptus tessellaris. Plant She Oak, native name Bilai, scientific name Casuarina glauca. Plant Oristoak, native name Baruda, scientific name Casuarina tortillosa. Plant Morton Bay Fig, native name Goan Guy, scientific name Ficus macrophylla. Plant Small Fig, native name Yuta, scientific name Ficus platypoda. Plant Apple Tree, native name Bupu. Scientific name Angophora intermedia.
plant rosewood, native name Bunuro, scientific name Acacia glaucescens, plant dogwood, native name Denner, scientific name Jasonia scoparis, plant corkwood or bat tree, native name Kuntam, scientific name Erythrin scoparis, plant mangroves, native name Tinchi, scientific name Brugiera radii, plant large honeysuckle, native name Bombara, scientific name Banksia latifolia, plant small honeysuckle, native name Minty, plant Banksia amula, plant Jibang, native name Dulandella, scientific name Persunia, plant bedfruit, native name Winam, scientific name Pandanus pedunculatus, plant stinging tree, native name Bragain, scientific name Laportius sp, plant grass trees, native name Dacobin, scientific name Xantharia, plant cabbage tree palm, native name Binca, scientific name Levisterna australis, plant common palm, native name Piki, scientific name Alcotona phoenix Cunninghamii, plant wattle black, native name Kagakal, scientific name Acacia Cunninghamii, plant scrub vine, native name Nanum, scientific name Malaysia tortuosa, plant lawyer cane, native name Tigum, scientific name Calamus speak, plant lawyer cane bribey dialect, native name Yini. Plant vine with yellow berries, native name Barra, scientific name Codrania javanensis. Plant scrub vine used for climbing, native name Ural, Ural Creek on Stradbroke, evidently the same name. Scientific name Fragilaria indica. Plant coarse grass used for diddy making, native name Diddy, scientific name Cerotes longifolia. Plant swamp plant used for fish poison, native name Tangul, scientific name Polygonum hydropiper. Plant Kunjevoi, native name Bundal, scientific name Alocasia macrogryza. Plant large bean and scrub, native name Yukam, scientific name Canavalia obtusifolia. Plant swamp fern, native name Bungwal. Scientific name Blechnum cerulatum. Plant bulrush, native name Yimbun. Scientific name Tipa augustifolia. Plant wild yam, native name Tam. Scientific name Dioscoria transversa. Plant ground orchids, native name Chingum. Scientific name Caledonia carnea, Caledonia alba. Plant white spotted berry, native name Midium, scientific name Myrtus tenifolia. White's name, Sarah Morton, native name Diniba. White's name, Catchpenny, native name Guaya. White's name, other black women, native name Taruchi, Bingi Bingi, Munan Topi. White's name, Bob Clift. Native name Genginda. White's name Milbong Jemmy. Native name Yilbong, meaning one eye. White's name Dundali. Native name Dundali, meaning Wonga pigeon. White's name King Sandy. Native name Kawali. Native meaning spilt. White's name Sam at Dunwich. Native name Yeridmu meaning mouth of native bee's nest. White's name Coban Tom, native name Mindy Mindy or Kutikri. White's name Diali, native name Diali, meaning tailor fish. White's name Jimmy, native name Wananga, meaning left it. Other men, Kuta, meaning native honey, Omuri, meaning the breast, tumbu, meaning maggot, tulamani, meaning creek court. 
Turwan, Great Man, Kippa, Young Man, Malara, Grown Man, Jundal, Woman, Pudang, Mother, Namul, Baby, Naring, Son, Bing, Father, Yinil, Creek or Gully, Warrel, Creek, Ipswich dialect, Bagor, Wood, Bungil, Grass, Banyo, Ridge, Bipo, Mountain, Mondo, Ridge, Wide Bay dialect, Tumba, Mountain, Wide Bay dialect. Yagga, No, Yawai, Yes, Bigi, Sun, Killen, Moon, Mirigan, Stars, Karumba, Big, Burpee, Little, Kalanga, Good, Maruchi dialect, Kangangang, Laughing Jackets, Tungi, Native Companion, Kundokan, Ditto, Strabrick Island dialect, Wagan, Crow, Kongong, Egg, Tawan, Fish, Kidin, Mosquito, Dibin, Common House Fly, Chidna, Track of Foot, Muru, Nose, Mara, Hand, Mill, Eye, Pidna, Ear, Tambor, Mouth, Tia, Teeth, Magur, Head, Wadli, Bad, Mugara, Thunder, Tanangor, Thirsty, Milan, Plenty, Tugun, Sea Waves, Kiri, North, Yungur, South, Wian, West, Bogin, East, Anan, Grey Eagle Hawk, Tuwai, Black Eagle Hawk, Buddha, Eagle Hawk, Wide Bay Dialect, Talabilla, Outlaw, Nalankali, Liar, Mirbong, Net for Kangaroo, Muntong, Net for Paddy Melons, Bula, Two, Bula Bula, Four, Dalobolpal, Camping Place, Tabalian Manga, Running Water, Inta Tabal Balkai, You Water, Fetch It, Mianjin Gata Yairana, Brisbane, I'm going. Intawana Yarana, you, we're going. In Wana Yan Man, same meaning, Wide Bay dialect. End of section 36. End of Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, dating from 1837, recorded by his daughter, Constance Campbell Petrie.